order, honorable members. The first item on the order paper is in the name of the chief whip of the majority party. I now recognize the chief whip of the majority party from the chamber. Thank you very much, House, House Chair and Honorable Members. I move that the House notwithstanding Rule 37 of our rules on the election of temporary presiding officers elects Honorable Chiu R. Yanki and Honorable Tima Beshala to act as temporary presiding officers in the chamber during hybrid session or sitting of the National Assembly and as when necessary for the duration of 2020 annual session, I here move uh, uh, House Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any objections to the motion? No objections agreed to. The second motion on the order paper is in the name of the chief whip of the majority party. I recognize the chief whip. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, House Chair and Honorable Members. Honorable Chair, I move that the House knows that on the 25th of July 2019, another committee to initiate and introduce legislation amending Section 25 of the Constitution was established and mandated to complete its task and report back to the House by the 31st of March 2020. On the 5th of March 2020, the Assembly extended the deadline of reporting to the 29th of May 2020. The other committee ceased to exist on the 29th of May 2020 before it could complete its mandate. The House re-establishes the ad hoc committee to initiate and introduce legislation amending Section 25 of the Constitution with the same composition and powers as it is as its predecessor, based on the minutes of the 25th of July 2019, which was on page 68. This House instructs the committee to incorporate on its work the proceedings and all the work of previous committee put up in of the previous committee as it was put up and including the 29th of May 2020 and set the deadline by which this committee is expected to report back to the House by the 20 by the by end of November 2020. I so move uh, chair. Thank you very much. But, no no by, by 31 December by 31 December 2020. So Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Request for declarations of vote have been received. And I will now allow one member of each political party wishing to make a declaration an opportunity to do so. Uh, the DA, the honorable Lotric, on which one? Yes, thank you very much, Chairperson. It is with a tremendous sense of irony and utter disbelief that I make this declaration today. Last week, Wednesday, the Minister of Finance stole the nation of the dire financial situation the country was in and warned of a sovereign debt crisis if we cannot improve the economy. He also referred to our enormous investment needs that cannot be delivered by government alone and that the private sector accounts for most of the investment spending in the economy. The country needs does not need more loans, it needs investment. But here's the disconnect, Chairperson. Less than a week after the finance minister painted this very somber picture of our economy, the ANC government wants to reestablish the ad hoc committee to initiate and introduce legislation amending section 25 of the constitution. The committee that has to finalize legislation to allow the state to expropriate your property without compensation. The truth is that nothing dissuades the security of their assets, regardless how innocuously it is couched. Local and foreign investors will think twice before investing in South Africa. The last thing South Africa can afford now 
amid a pandemic and an economic crisis that has been in the making for 26 years is a focus on expropriation without compensation. Jobs are being lost, businesses are closing down, farm attacks are escalating, and the state's supposed safety net set, set are letting desperate citizens down. Voorzitter, in the ANC is a great beleid focus in these moeilijke tijden onteining zonder vergoeding. Wat een ongelooflijke verwijderdheid van die werkelijkheid. Die land is in nood. Ons het nou elke bykie hulp nodig wat daar is. Elke besluit van die regering moet nou daarop gemik wees om vertrouwen en securiteit aan die landsburgers te bied. Om die land so aantrekkelijk as moendlik te maak om beleggers te lok en aan te moedig. Maar in plaas daarvan om te erken dat grondhervorming oor die afgelopen 26 jaar aan die achterste speen gesuig het as gevolg van corruptie, on... word een komitee nou weer in die lewe geroep wat vernietigende gevolge op economische en sociaal maatschappelijke vlak te weeg gaan bring. Hier is duidelijk nie een regering wat die welzijn van al sy burgers op jaar dra nie. In hierdie tijd van ongekende nood, commercieel en opkomen, wat de harte vir die mense vir die land opgemaak het. En die ANC is er die achter op, kom ons focus weer op onteining sonder vergoeding. Voorzitter, die DA steen nie die wijziging van artikel 25 van die grondwet nie. Ons steen nie die gebrekkige processe wat tot dusver gevolg is nie. En ons stel voor dat hierdie komitee en die hele proces van die tafel verweider word. Dankie. The following speaker is uh, Akbar Shibambu from the virtual platform. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. So on the 27th of February 2018, the Economic Freedom Fighters moved a motion which was adopted by the National Assembly on amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution to permit for expropriation of land without compensation. And that resolution, amongst others, noted that South Africa has got a history of brutal disposition of land from black people by the settler colonial white minority. That is the reality that defines South Africa. So there is absolutely nothing that is going to stop us from expropriation, reposition of land without compensation. And in terms of the resolution that was taken in that particular sitting, it said that uh, Section 25 of the Constitution must be amended and that a review, that the committee must be set up, a constitutional review committee must be set up to review and amend Section 25 of the Constitution to make it possible for the state to expropriate land in the public interest without compensation. And in the process, we must conduct public hearings. And one aspect of that resolution, which is uh, ignored even by the ad hoc committee, which uh, we are re-establishing now, it said that we must propose the necessary constitutional amendments with regards to the kind of future land tenure regime needed, taking into account the necessity of the state being a custodian of all South Africa's land. That is what we resolved. And the constitutional review committee took a resolution which was adopted by both the National Assembly and the NCOP, which said that Section 25 of the Constitution must be amended to make explicit that which is implicit in the Constitution with regards to expropriation of land without compensation as a legitimate option for land reform, so as to address the historic wrongs caused by the arbitrary disposition of land, and in so doing, ensure equitable access to land and further empower the majority of South Africans to be productive participants in ownership, food security, and agricultural reform programs. So there is no corona which is going to stop the expropriation of land without compensation. So we support as the EFF the re-establishment of the committee that is going to now effectively change Section 25 of the Constitution because we must change the historical compromises that have left our people landless. So he retani EFF Msaba I will sell win. I will sell you Amabukweni. Yabanu Banti Mala South Africa, La Africa, Zonga. We in Kweni, Kotaku, Benefitaka, Yona Yukus. 
misaba yo ono wa ntena ibano baba lungu laba nga iteka inkani baba nga iteka ikuluisa bako kwa wa hii so that the EFF will support the real establishment We're losing you, Honorable Shibambu. We're losing you. Are you lost. finished? Honorable Shibambu? Thank you very much. We shall pass. Uh, the, the Honorable Butelezi from the virtual platform for the IFP. Uh, Chairperson, uh, Honourable Butelez is having some difficulties, so I'm going to do the declaration on behalf of the IFP. May I proceed? proceed sir. Thank you very much, Honourable Chairperson. Chairperson, I'm going to resist the temptation of being drawn into a debate on the merits of whether or not uh, Section 25 should be amended or not. I think that is not before us today. What is before us today is endorsing a process that may or may not lead to any constitutional amendments. I think the IFP's position has been quite clear on, on the, uh, the need to amend Section 25. We do not support the need to amend Section 25 to make it uh, explicit or implicit or whatever the words that are used uh, that you could expropriate land. As the IFP, we believe that there are sufficient legal instruments currently, starting from the Constitution and, and other pieces of legislation that would allow us to ensure that what was wrong in the days of the apartheid is made right today. And that is to restore land, to redistribute land to those that were deprived of land in the past. What is required, Honorable Chairperson, is those legal instruments to be supported financially, as the Honorable Member of the DA said. And, and, however, today we are discussing a process and we believe that due process must be followed in this uh, important piece of work that Parliament has been given and that there must be proper consultation uh, with all in interested and affected parties. And COVID-19 has certainly impacted, uh, impacted on, the, on, 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 on the process that was established by the committee. So we, we believe that the committee needs more time and we don't know if they can finish the work by the 31st of December. We wish them luck in that process, but to re-emphasize that we do not support this piece of legislation and re-emphasize that this is not the matter on the table. The table is the extension, extending the work of the committee, which we support. So we support the draft resolution in terms of extending uh, the time frame that has been allocated to the committee and further debate will emerge from my political party and from others in the committee process. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Metro, on virtual platform, please mute your mic. Uh, the Honorable C.P. Milder in the chamber. Honorable Chairperson, the origin of this process was the ANC conference in December 21st, 2017 at Nasrek. And we are paying the, today the price of ANC factionalism. While the Ramaphosa camp was enjoying their victory, the Eskotazana Dlamini Zuma camp quickly passed this resolution at the conference. We all know that. We all know that. So in the past, in the past, the EFF tried to pass that kind of resolution in this house, and it was not accepted. But like true hyenas, the EFF, after the resolution passed in the ANC internally, came in February 2018 and passed the ANC resolution. We all know that. We all know those facts. We were in the House. Now, it's not as if our economy was not in total chaos at the beginning of the year when the, when the Minister of Finance brought the budget to this House. But if that's not enough, the signal that this government now wants to send to the world is, please invest and feel free to relax. We are only going to confiscate your property without compensation. Another word for that wonderful phrase is, we're going to steal your property. Now, 
countries that do that have the wonderful distinction to become the pariahs of the world. So the ANC wants to go down that route. We, our economy is in this position because for 25 years we are paying the price of failed ANC policies in terms of socialism. We've seen the corruption, we've experienced that. It was Thatcher who was correct when she said about your policies of socialism. The problem with socialism is that Dr. in the end, you run money. out Dr. of Dr. Money. That person, please, on a Okay, Honorable Laswart, yes, There please. are continual interruptions for the speaker. We listen to other speakers. Would you please mute the mics and instruct members on the virtual platform not to interrupt the speaker? Thank you, House Chair. Honorable members on virtual platforms, I say, uh, please, if you switch on your mic mm -hmm. and make some remarks, you are actually against the rules of the house because you have to get permission to sit on your mic when you are in the house. This ruling has been done many a times, and I just want to warn everybody out there, if you repeat that, I'm going to instruct ICT to mute you till the end of the session. Thank you very much. Continue, Honorable uh, Thank, you, Honorable, thank you, Honorable Speaker, uh, Chairperson. The fact that they are making all that noise clearly indicates that I'm saying something that they don't want to hear. And we all know why that is the case. The so the point of the point, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Paulson, ICT, can you mute Honorable Paulson? I'm sorry, Honorable let me, let, let, me spend a, let me spend a few seconds on the EFF. I've just heard from the Honorable Shivambu that the virus will not prevent this. The virus are keeping them out of the house. They are in the basement like Joe Biden. The poor ones, not one of them's got the guts to appear in this house. What a pathetic lot we've got here in South Africa. Honorable Chairperson, the fact of the matter is we will debate this issue, but can't you understand that you are sending a signal to the world that you want to become like Zimbabwe? It's absolutely the wrong thing to do. You may have wonderful ideas, but in the end, the failure of land reform is the result of government policies in the last 25 years, when not enough money was spent because of corruption, because money was stolen throughout this whole process, we are paying the price today. We will oppose this resolution, and we will get international and other support within South Africa to try and convince you of those absolutely idiotic ways in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Thring on, blood, on visual platform, it's your time. On a point of order, House Chair. Honorable Shibambu, what's your point of order? There's no yeah, one you, on the well, platform now. We wanted to now. call him to order when he was Let me be called the idiots. We, we, we wanted to Honorable call him to point of order when he was still on the platform, but we muted, we couldn't do so now. It's absolute rubbish for an Africana colonial settler to want to suggest that we're hiding. We are taking a correct, responsible action as the EFF to disassociate with activities that, that will prevent all us all from reclaiming our land. We are participating in this process all properly. So there's nothing that we can take from a white colonial me. settler who wants to protect the... Now, ICG, please mute him. Honorable Shivambu, that's not a point of order, but a point of debate. We continue. Honorable Thring, you have the... Honorable what is Zulu. debate? White people stole the land. Honorable Zulu and Honorable Paulson should be muted. Honorable Thring. Uh, Thank you, uh, Honorable House Chair. When this House voted in July 2019 to re-establish a committee which would write legislation to amend Section 25 of the Constitution to allow government to expropriate land without compensation, the ACGP voted against the motion. We believe that it was wrong then, and our view has not changed. It is the firm belief of the ACGP that the expropriation of land without compensation is nothing more than a populist political tool to consolidate and hold onto power, regardless of the consequences and 
consequences there shall be. Since 1994, the government has acquired 8.2 million hectares of land through the restitution and redistribution process. This has cost some 39.2 billion rand. Of those offered a choice of either cash or land, 93% chose cash. And of those who chose land, over 90% of those farmlands have now failed as admitted by government in a question and answer session in parliament. Effectively, the South African government has paid the farmers for productive farmland and then paid 93% of the claimants for the same land because they chose cash instead of land. This at an extra cost of some 13.5 billion. In addition to this gross waste of money, the nation lost the food produced and the export potential from this productive farmland. Sadly, from 2010 to 2019, in addition to the challenges that we have, there have been some 571 farm murders 2,874 farm attacks on both black and white farmers. From over 100,000 farmers post 1994, South Africa has approximately 35,000 white farmers and 5,000 black farmers to feed almost 60 million people. The murders must stop. The farm attacks must stop. And any individual or politician found guilty of constituting incitement to cause harm or death of our farmers must face the full might of the law. The ACDP has acknowledged the need for reformation and restitution on the land, land question. The question, however, is not in the why, but how. We have consistently said that expropriation without compensation is not the panacea to the land question. Property rights must be protected, and a failure to protect property rights and to issue title deeds to property owners destroys the value of such property, drives away much needed local and foreign investment, deprioritizes agricultural development, and diminishes food security. It is now time. It is not the time for breaking, but building. This is not the time for racial divisions, but rather a time for all races to unite. It is a time that all South African citizens are prioritized before any political agenda. South Africa belongs to all who live in a irrespective of their color. I thank you. As one must go thank to you, church. ICT, can you please mute Honorable Ntlangwini also? Is that ungodly Christian? Chairperson, Chairperson, I raise on a point of order. Yes, Honorable. You instructed Nazib, Honorable Nazib Posen to have his mic mute. He's just accused Mr. Wainthring of not being a Christian. I'd ask that you look into that and you instruct him to withdraw that. It is a well-known fact that Honorable Wainthring is a pastor, he is a believer, and he should be entitled to be protected by this house. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you. I, I, I could not hear that part, but I will certainly follow it up. Thank you very much. I am informed that... Uh, ICT that cannot mute uh, people, these people on virtual. So uh, if they mute, yes, if they have to mute pen permanently, it means all the other mics will be muted. So please help us. A point us. of when order, I say mute, Chair. A point of order, honorable, Chair. Yes, Honorable Zulu, what's your point of order? My point of order is that you instruct people to mute mics when, I don't know when is it convenient when others are able to be muted and now we, uh, somebody is saying that uh, members cannot be muted. We have been muted even when we are orderly wanting to raise a point of order. If everyone has to be muted, everybody has to be muted. It cannot be that there is a selection Honorable, in the muting. Honorable Zulu, I think that is a technical issue that we cannot, I cannot handle. But please, uh, if you want to raise a point of order, then you can unmute yourself and raise a point of order. My worry is the issue of just interfering when your mic is on. That is very wrong. And we are not going to allow that. Thank you. We continue. Honorable Shaikh Imam.
Honorable Sheikh Imam. Honorable Chair, can you hear me? Yes, you can are you hear audible. Me, you can. Yes. yes, thank you very much. Let me start off, Honorable Chair, by saying that the National Freedom Party will support this process. And let me tell you why we will support this process. We must admit, our House Chair, that for the last 25 years or years, the process was not accelerated. Even though there are mechanisms currently in terms of Section 25, it may not necessarily have needed an amendment. But I think the question one must ask is, what is motivating us to either support or not support this process? We know that we are one of the most unequal societies in the world. We know that today when somebody talks to you, the first question they ask you is not even your name anymore. Where do you come from? So your dignity and your identity originates from where you live. And we know that most of our people remain landless. We must admit that the land that was taken away from our people was done in the most inhumane manner. Now, the question that we need to ask, Chairperson, is why is it that there are still those that want to allow that land to remain in the hands of those who took it away unlawfully in the most inhumane manner many, many years ago. What we want to do is to accelerate this process and any process or mechanism that we can put in place to ensure that you give back the dignity to fellow South Africans, particularly the poorest of the poor, must be supported. And for me, from what I can observe, Honorable Chairperson, it seems like it's all about the votes. There are people in this country that are occupying land for many years and do not have any rights over that land at all. So I, is it fair? Indeed, it is not fair. So this process that we want to put in place must be supported. And I don't know where the fear comes from, because we've said again and again, we are not planning to go there in an unscrupulous manner and just take away the land. We're going to do it in a dignified manner, but what is important is take away from those who are reluctant to release the land that they have actually stolen from the poorest of the poor and return it to its rightful owners. That is all we are actually saying. So I think we should come together, let this process unfold, and then ensure that we do what is in the best interest of all South Africans. Right now, Honorable Chairperson, majority of the land remains in the hands of a few. Even your water, your dams, majority of them still is in the hands of a few. The economy is in the hands of a few. It is totally unacceptable. The National Freedom Party will support any process to ensure that this process of expediting the return of the land to the poorest of the poor is done without any further delay. The National Freedom Party supports this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Honorable Honorable Hendricks. Uh, uh, thank you, Honorable Chair, Honorable House Chair. Uh, at the Youth Parliament, the ANC uh, had a quarrel with Al Jamar's uh, speaker that the project of 1994 failed. Al Jamar continues to hold that position because of the issues relating to ownership of land. The ANC, however, must be complimented for ensuring that the process triggered by the EFF is, is given new life and Aldama supports the motion uh, that is before you, uh, House Chair. Aldama supports uh, the continuation of this process. However, Aldama feels that reparations is better than uh, expro expropriating uh, land without compensation. But uh, that's a position that we will put to the committee uh, once uh, it has been re-established. Re you know, House Chair, that Germany is still in some way paying off reparations for the harm they cause. It takes nearly a hundred years uh, 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 to, pay, uh, to, to undo the harm that, uh, that, that has been done. And as you know, the harm done by apartheid will most probably take 200 years to undo. And uh, so we feel that uh, reparations is also an option. But at this particular stage, al Jamaa. Uh, supports the continuation of this process. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you very much. 
the last speaker on this will be the Honorable Mahat of the ANC in the chamber. <laughs> uh, honorable chairperson, let me greet um, let me greet you in the name of the youngest son of the King's party of the Bapedi tribe, who was brutally murdered by the Boers for having asked them the following in a letter of defiance against the land dispossession of his people at his headquarters of Mufulufu. I quote, I will address you boys, you men who know God. Do you think there is God who will punish, punish lying, left, uh, theft, and deceit? I, I ask you now for the truth. I pray for the truth because I also speak my whole truth. I say the land belongs to us. Let me take this opportunity to further greet you again. Let me greet you in the name of the Kosa Chief Chakwa and Ndlambe, who were ambushed by the British cowards on Christmas Day 1811, when troops under the command of one of follow called Lieutenant Colonel John Graham, after whom Garamstown is named, marched into Kosa territory and cowardly killed them and stole their land on January 11, 1812. You are further greeted in the name of the Zulu warrior, who after the greatest of uh, victories at the Battle of, of Isandwal against the land dispossession, were defeated at the Battle of Black River in, on December 16, 1838, against the settlers and saw the king of Zulu, Zululand allegedly axed by the white colonial authorities in 1879. Let me take this opportunity to remind honorable members of the August House that history has no blank pages. Desperate and forceful removal of African people under colonialism and apartheid resulted not only in the physical separation of our people along racial lines, but also in the extreme land shortages, insecure land rights, and poverty for the majority of the black people. Chairperson, this onslaught did not only leave us poor, but landless. The land was of our forebears was stolen and must be retained. As South, African, as South Africans, we must remain resolute in ensuring that Section 25 of the Constitution is amended to redress the injustice of the past. For this, from its formation, the ANC has fought for the return of the land to its rightful owners. The resolution of the land question is in South Africa is central to the achievement of the National Democratic Society. In, it requires that we reflect critically and honestly on the impact of the transformative legislation. Honorable Chairperson, the Fifth Parliament adopted a report to amend Section 25 for the expropriation of land without compensation. This milestone is a is fundamental aspect towards what the ANC has resolved in, in the 54th Conference, guided by its existing policy of 1992 ready to govern. The Sixth Parliament is therefore mandated to deal with the actual amendment in detail form for formulation to formulate an actual text that must amend this particular constitution. The aim of the process is to show expropriation without compensation become a reality in order to replace the willing buyer, willing seller with a just and equitable principle. Chairperson, we must not be misled as this how about food security. The previous committee took a consideration on the international implications of the amendment of section 25. These treaties are as a result of a democratic government participation in many multilateral forums such as United Nations and African Union. We have considered the legal and economic implications, political implications of expropriation of land without compensation. And we are therefore confident that no policy uncertainty and investment risk are within, the, are within acceptable global standards. Chairperson, giving Without giving the poor the means of productive farm the land, we will not defeat poverty. Therefore, the land must be used as an economic asset to ensure food security and facilitate economic development. The prophets of doom are held bent on instigating our people against this process through malicious and threats on food security. The ANC will remain vigilant and responsible that we will not allow people towards a process that will collapse the country. 
and the economy. However, they do so precisely because they know that the, top, the clock is ticking and majority of South Africans will support this process. In fact, amending Section 25 is an opportunity for South Africans not only to compromise, but to enhance food security in this country. Chairperson, a three... <laughs> Chairperson, Honorable Chairperson, no political party in this House has outright went two thirds majority to change the constitution of the republic. Therefore, it is prudent to show who are the true revolutionaries of our people in this house. Therefore, we should forge unity in the best interest of general population of the working class and the poor, especially on the land question. The land was stolen, the land must be retained. As a free advice to the proponent of the right wing elements, this is an opportunity once, once to be on the right side of history and do the honorable thing by retaining the land. Chairperson, let me remind Honorable Milder that the land question has been an issue even before the ANC was formed. You, others came here in 1652, took our land, but the ANC took a clear resolution that our the land is an element, is a property that becomes important to the laws of our people. That's why throughout, even during its formation, it has taken a clear resolution that the land must be retained. Therefore, politics of the ANC today will not deter us on the land. In actual fact, the ANC is resolute and is united against the issue of the land. Therefore, Chairperson, we therefore respond and the process to amend the Section 25. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mahatsi. Honorable <laughs> members. Mam uh, Dikhal, mute. Uh, thank you very much, honorable members. I now put the motion. Are there any objections? House Chairperson. Honorable Mazzoni. Thank you for recognizing me, House Chair. The DA would like to call for a division. Honorable Chairperson. Yes, before, honorable Melda. Before anyone can call for a division, you must formally put the motion. And if you've made a pronouncement on the result, then we can do so. Honorable uh, uh, Mulder, usually when a, a division is called, we don't go back to uh, finding if there are any objections. We do that after. Thank you very much. Can we continue now uh, to the vote? To, to, to the, 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 the voting has been called. The division has been called by the DA. And I'm going to allow a 10 minutes for the bells to be rung. Amanza, away to everybody should have a Range Rover.
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, order, honorable members. The doors can now be locked. Honorable members, as the speaker has determined that in accordance with the rules, a manual voting will be used for the division. Uh, firstly, in order to, to establish the quorum. Party whips will then be given an opportunity to confirm the number of their members present and indicate if they vote for or against the question. A member who wishes to abstain or vote against uh, the party vote may do so by informing the chair. Having confirmed uh, that we have the requisite for quorum, we will now proceed. The, yes, the, there is that confirmation. The question before the house is that the motion as raised by the chief whip be agreed to. The voting will now commence. The door of the chamber will be locked and members will not be allowed to enter the virtual platform until this vote is concluded. ICT will be counting on the members that are presently on virtual platform and according to the numbers that they have given us. WIPs could confirm the number of your members in the present in the chamber and on virtual platform and indicate, as said before, if they vote against or, or abstain. Uh, honorable members, check your gadgets. As party whips, uh, party whips ready to record the votes of their members who are present. Thank you. I'm going to start with the ANC. Please give us the number of members on virtual platform and members in the house. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. House Chair, the African National Congress on virtual platform, we have 157 members. The African National Congress here in the NA chamber, we have 20 members, totaling up to 177. The ANC vote in support of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Captured. The DA. Thank you, House Chairperson. In the House, the DA has 17 members. On the virtual platform, the DA has 58 members. That gives us a total of 75 members who are voting against the motion. Thank you. The EFF. House Chair. Uh, oh, oh, okay, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable Shibambu. Proceed. The EFF has got 44 members and we're all voting in favor of the rest establishment of the ADO committee to reclaim our land decisively without composition. Thank you very much, IFP. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the numbers are as follows. One member in the House, nine on virtual, 10 members voting yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the FF Plus. Uh, Chairperson, we've got... 10 members, nine members on virtual and one in the house. And yes, we are against, and you better take note of that. 
Thank you. The ACGP. Thank you, Vice Chair. Two on virtual, two in the House voting against. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the UDM. Kosi Kwangka. In Kosi Kwangka. UDM. We'll come back to you. Uh, the, the ATM. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. We are two in the virtual meeting. We fully support the reestablishment of the committee. Uh, good. Thank you, Chairperson. We are good. two on the virtual meeting and we are in support. Thank you very much. The NFP, NFP, Honorable Sheikh Imam and Honorable CBC, are you all on the platform? And we'll come back to you. Who is that? Is that Honorable CBC? Okay, I'll come back to NFP again. The AIC. Thank you very much, Chapter Corner. AIC. The AIC supports the amendment. Thank you. Co. Oh, how many? How many? You are two. So, are you all on platform? Oh, 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 okay. Thank you. Yeah. So it's one, to... on one and one in the house. Thank you. One virtual. Uh, thanks, really, Hope. Thank you, Honorable Chair. One on virtual, one in the house. We vote in support. Thanks. Thank you. The PAC. Al Chapasin, we voting in sub. Thank you very much. Al Jama. Uh, Honorable House Chair, we are one virtual and we vote in support of the motion by the Honorable Chief Whip, which we love very much. Uh, I'm going back to now to the UDM. UDM, are you there now? UDM? UDM, are you there now? Okay, the UDM is not there. Who else did I leave out before? Uh, okay, everybody has voted. Chairperson, it was the NFP. NFP. From the NFP, Chairperson. Okay, the NFP, yes. NFP, are you there now? Chairperson, I've received they a are message. Not there. Chairperson, I've received a message from uh, Honorable Sheikh Imam saying that he's trying to get in, waiting for the host, whatever that means. I'll leave it in your discretion. Thank you. No. My discretion will say that he is not now counted because he is not on any platform. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, honorable members. I just want ICT to verify that the numbers that were called in the house from the virtual platform are correct.
honorable members, after the verification by the ICT, I'm informed that the EFF, you have got only 40 members on virtual as opposed to 44. Can we correct that? I was, I was Can checked. we correct that? I was checked. Yes. All our members are yes, in and those. Yeah, those, those that are not seen by the IT system is because they've been logging in and the system has been taking them out. We're all here. The entire caucus of okay. the EFF is voting order, in favor. Honorable, order. Order, honorable members. Honorable Shivambo, I hear you. I think your case is the same case as the NFP. And I just want to say that uh, when the doors closed, they were outside, so we'll record 40, no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now just waiting for the, the numbers. Okay. Honorable members, uh, the, 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 the additions have been made. We have 89 no to the vote. And then we have got the yes being 237. That's saying that the, 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 the motion has been carried. And uh, unless I, I need uh, other parties that would like to object to the vote, we can note your, your, we can note your objections so that we note them. Thank you very much, it's done. So the motion is carried. Thank you very much. We now move to the... Uh, the third uh, item, debate on a matter of national public importance in terms of Rule 130. The next item on the order paper is an urgent matter of national public importance in the name of the Honorable N.V. Mente on the scourge of gender-based violence against women and femicide. The Honorable Mentor, you are welcome. Thank you uh, very much, so, Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, yes, we have brought this topic up for debate in this house, not because we think it must be a tradition <laughs> that whenever there are reported cases of gender-based violence. There must be a debate in this house. No, we brought it to the attention of this house because we sincerely believe that all arms of the state, in particular the legislative arm, are fiddling while Rome is burning. We brought this topic back here because we are women and we feel the pain of gender-based violence more than anyone here. It is us women who are condemned to walk the streets of this country worried that death may be visited on us anytime, anywhere, and, and by any male, particularly those males who are closer to us, those we work with, those we go to church with, and those we share a home with. Living as a woman in this country means you can expect to be beaten up by at any time to be raped anytime and be killed anytime with impunity. We all know this. We know the statistics and have brandished those, them here many a times before. But behind those statistics are human beings whose lives are altered forever. And we, as the leaders of an important arm of the state, have, haven't done anything significant to take away the pain. The last time we were here, we ask that parliament must establish a permanent parliamentary committee on gender-based violence. We argued that this committee should receive reports from the police and the NPA about the status of cases of gender-based violence weekly. Had this been done, we would be able to hold these key institutions of the criminal justice system to account. 
This is so because the investigation and successful prosecution of gender-based violence cases remains the weakest link in the fight against gender-based violence. The last time we were here, we also asked that parliament working with the relative departments such as Department of Women, Youth and People Living with Disabilities should establish shelters for abused women. Many women go to the police to report cases of violence and then are forced to go back home to the very homes where they experience abuse because they have nowhere else to go. We also called for the establishment of a parliamentary call center where abused women and children would be able to call and get given direction to law enforcement as, law, as well as the psychological care. We also need the legislative reinforcement to make sure that perpetrators of violent crimes against women do not get banned. In the aftermath of the merciless killing of Uyinene Mkwajana, may her soul rest in peace. President Ramaphosa promised that the cabinet would introduce a legislative amendment to ensure, among other things, that there is no bail for perpetrators of gender-based violence and that the sentences to these offenses are tightened. Up to this day, no amendments from the cabinet to the legislation have been introduced. It has been business as usual for both parliament and the police. If parliament doesn't go beyond debate and start making tangible interventions, many more women will die at the hands of men in this country. For goodness sake, we need to stop it. We need to be parliament of action. We must hold the police to account. We must hold the NPA to account. And the judiciary must also know that they need to stop releasing rapists back into society to wreak havoc on the lives of women. We must do our bit to stop this war against women in this country. We are here today because Akona's rapist was arrested by police and released on a mere 800 rand bail back to the community. He raped Asipe's grandmother and killed her. We are here today because a soldier raped a 70-year-old woman and inquiry will find him not guilty and this parliament will be marked. We are here today because forensic labs have no capacity to speedily link rape successfully to the cases of gender-based violence. We plead on the health department and the minister Tyler, intervention must be done before the end of July. We are here today because police still turn victims away and instruct them to go to hospital first. We plead with the Minister of Police that the FCS units must be capacitated before the end of July. We are here today because we have realized the source of the problem is this parliament. We are here today to plead with men to help us fight this. We are here today to call for this parliament to have weekly reports from both the SAPS and the NPA on gender-based violence cases before the end of July. We are here today to tell men in the words of Mama Miriam Makeba, I am a very peaceful person, but if they fail to teach their sons not to rape and kill our daughters, we must never fail to teach our daughters to defend themselves with everything they have. We are here today to tell the president to ban alcohol during this period that exacerbates GBV violence in our home. We are here today to tell this parliament to act and have the scourge of violence against women and children. We are here today because this parliament have not acted on its own member, boy, mama, boy. The ethics committee is mom and there is no report against this. If this parliament continues as business as usual amongst its own and with their own members that are always beating women and also implicated in crimes of gender-based violence and killing of and murdering of children. We are here and we will be doomed. Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable member. The next speaker is the honorable Nkomo from the ANC. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson, uh, members of the executive, honorable members, both on virtual platform and also in the chambers. Honorable Chair, women in our society live in a paralyzing fear. Every day, women are being slaughtered and obliterated in the wildest and manageable manner. 
gender-based violence is not a sketch. It is not a crisis. It is a pandemic. Women in this country have become an endangered species. Every year we assemble and deliver it on gender-based violence and femicide. This is intolerable. Gender-based violence is a humiliating disgrace to all women in our society. It defies the very essence in which our constitution is embedded in, human dignity. This can never be a business as usual. For decades, women have been in the forefront of the struggle for gender equality. Women have been fighting for their cries to be heard. Men need to rise. Men need to take a stand against gender inequality. They need to take responsibility to the injustices done to women. They need to play their part and challenge other men in ending gender-based violence. Women, women cannot fight this pandemic alone. Men and women live in one, in one society. It is therefore incumbent on everybody together, women and men, to join forces to eradicate patriarchal practices and stereotypical attitudes. The engagement of men and boys is invaluable and incalculable in advancing women's rights and empowering and achieving gender inequality. Honorable Chair, patriarchy is the enemy towards realizing gender equality. We have, a, we, have, we have to directly deal with patriarchy and demolish all forms of its manifestation in our society. Our country suffers an economic system challenge of colonialism and apartheid. And in that, women were, women were the most discriminated against and displayed, and, and this gave rise to patriarchy in our society. As men were subjugated to apartheid law, although they too were oppressed, women suffered triple opp opp oppression in terms of gender, race, and class. Out of frustrations and due to material condition, women are subjected to, to be treated as objects of frustrations for men. And this still perpetuates today in our society and has continued to manifest as a gender-based violence. Women continue to be abused by their partners. They continue to be mad at and treated as objects of frustration. The government took a bold step to institutionalize gender equality. Gender mainstreaming was a critical approach to realize gender equality across all institutions. Gender mainstreaming, therefore, resulted in establishment of substantial gender machinery across government, including the launching of National Gender Machinery Summit. The National Gender Machinery is a substance significant of addressing challenges that women are facing today as such as gender-based violence and femicide, discrimination based on sex and gender, and multiple social problems. In essence, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Chair, deep economic exclusion and failure to redistribute wealth are the underlying reason for what is happening in our country. Social economic issues are the material driving issues on what is happening in families in our country. The government ratified a number of international and regional instruments that promote gender equality, including the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination and Against Women, against women which was ratified in 1995. The Beijing Declaration and Platforms for Action and the Optimal Protocol to CEDAW, ratified in 2005. South Africa is bound by all international, regional, and sub-regional laws ratified and must take all necessary steps to protect women from discrimination and abuse in all spheres. South Africa has taken bold steps to institutional gender equity. Recently, the government, together with the civil society, developed the emergency response plan to assist gender-based violence victims and survivors. Furthermore, to assure that effective implementation of the gender-based violence national strategic plan. The government inaugurated the interministerial committee to provide leadership and oversight on the establishment and programs established. Honorable Chair, violence in all its forms is endemic in South African society. Both sexual and domestic violence are per pervasive and all women live under threat of or experience violence. Patriarchy must be uprooted and eradicated in our society. We eradicate patriarchy norms and standards deeply entrenched in traditional, cultural, religious, and systematic values in our society. Implement, implement and inculcate programs aimed at introducing gender equality in our education system, commun and communities, employment policies, and across all corners of society and all racial lines. Patriarchy must be psychologically uprooted for it not to perpetuate in our society. We cannot live in a society where women live in constant fear of their lives and traumatized by men who claim to protect them. Women's body is not a man's crime scene. Women's lives matter. Enough is enough. I thank you, House Chair. Madibongwe. 
Thank you very much. Please don't do that, Honorable Member. Don't do that. Uh, the Honorable Chief Whip of the Opposition, Honorable Mazzoni. Who is going to protect me from being raped and murdered? The number of gender-based violence crimes has risen 500% since the start of the COVID lockdown. Lifeline SA Chief Executive Molefi Takalo said that the number of distress calls went up from 12,000 to almost 80,000 since the first week of the lockdown. There is absolutely no place in South Africa where a woman or a girl is safe. We are not safe at home. We are not safe in the car. We are not safe on public transport. We are not safe at school. We are not safe in university. We are not safe in the mall. We are not safe in a club or a bar. We are not safe in the shops. We are not safe at the post office. We are not safe at work. Women and girls in South Africa live in perpetual fear. It is not normal and it will not stop. Women are not raping women. Girls are not raping girls. Women are not killing women. Girls are not killing girls. We have a rape culture in South Africa and it is not the fault of women or any victim. The narrative in this country has to change and men have to take responsibility. I wanna make it very clear that I do not subscribe to the notion that all men are trash. I believe that there are men in this very house who would give up their lives to save me and to make sure other women are also safe. But you gentlemen need to multiply in numbers and you need to start spreading the message of what is acceptable behavior and what is not. It cannot be that in parliament, little boys use this platform to fight an old fight about a girlfriend. It cannot be that a lawyer goes on Twitter because he doesn't like a journalist and makes sexually demeaning comments that could lead to violence against her. This is an attack and it is not okay. Woman, I beg of you, let us stop talking and let us start fighting back. If you cannot stop the attack, realize that you are a hero for surviving, but do not give up. Do not stop until your attacker is found and prosecuted. We need to fundamentally change the way men see women in society. We proudly stand up here and we say, if you strike a woman, you strike a rock. But where is the respect in real life? How can it be that in the parliament of South Africa, a then deputy president will hold up various flavors of condoms to show the nation that the government is assisting with safe sex? Because of course, every man has the right to have sex, but not one person has yet stood up in this house with a sanitary pad or a tampon and announced that every woman will have the ability to have be dignified while menstruating. Women are giving up because it seems that there is no use in reporting GBV. Men need to listen to us. Women are being chopped up. Pregnant women are being murdered with babies in their bellies. Little children, little girls are having their vaginas ripped apart and their bodies ripped apart by men who are raping them. This is no longer just a problem in our country. It is indicative that we have a society of psychopaths and these psychopaths need to be dealt with. We cannot continue like this, South Africa. We are at war with ourselves. There is a piece of legislation that we need to push through and it's the forensic bill legislation. Currently, 46,000 Schedule 8 convicts do not have DNA samples listed with the South African government. We do not know if they have been released. We do not know where they are. We cannot track them. I beg every man in this house, I beg every man in this country, help protect me. Help protect every girl, every woman. We are daughters, we are wives, we are mothers, we are grandmothers, we are aunts, we are nieces, we are cousins, we are sisters. We can only do this together. If you as men do not stand up for me and for all women and for all girls, Thank you. it will not be a case of Thank if you. I am raped and murdered. It will be a case of when I'm raped and when I'm murdered. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, House Chair. Chair, let, the, let this be the last time that you speak about gender-based violence in the sixth parliament, because we wake up to the news of gruesome and unspeakable killings of women, children, and in particular, girl children. What is more painful, Speaker, is the fact that while no one amongst us is spared gender-based violence, education does not matter, race does not matter, age does not matter, you still get killed. But today I want to talk about the pain and suffering of women and girl child living with disability. Their cries, their pain, their suffering, like living with a disability is to society an afterthought. And I want to say today, enough is enough. They are raped and cannot enter a police station because there's no wheelchair ramp. They go through the humiliation of being carried inside a police station only to find that no one inside the police station, including the most senior people, have ever thought that should a person living with disability come to the police station, what will happen without the wheelchair program? How do you move around inside the police station? How do you even access ablution facilities where there's no disability-friendly ablution facilities? This is not toxic cocktail of gender inequality, speaker. Disability exclusion and gender-based violence, and for black people, Black women in particular, racial discrimination. It must end, Speaker. Women and girl and child living with disability should not be an afterthought. Speaker, the sad reality is that we are led by people who just do not care. A young woman was raped by her boyfriend on Friday. She went to report at Zwede Satellite Police Station, which falls under Zosakele Police Station, and was turned back at the gate by a policeman who said to the girl that rape cases can only be opened if the victim has seen a doctor. Station commander, Brigadier Vellum, does not care. He even instructed the people at the police station that they should not give his contact details to any victim. And therefore, he's not even accessible. So there's no case of escalating these issues to the station commander. We called the minister of police, Boiki uh, Begitka, to report the matter to him. And you promised to, to speak to the provincial Commissioner General Ntinga. He also did nothing. The young man then went to Dora Ginza Hospital on Sunday and was turned back and told to go to the nearest clinic. The CEO there, Patrick Tibolani, refused to attend to the girl because he just don't care. Even with the Minister of Police and the Provincial Commissioner being aware of this gruesome violence by the state against a rape victim, those in charge of police station and hospitals just do not get bothered. On Monday morning, the girl went, the lady went to Soweto Clinic in Banga, only to find that it was closed due to COVID-19. The same Monday, the minister was contacted and once again, and only then was the young lady assisted by the provincial commissioner three days later, reducing any prospect of, of successful prosecution and conviction. This goes all the way to the president and the cabinet ministers. There is simply no sense of agency. More than Days of women require solutions for empowerment, wrote to the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, the NGPP and the Presidency to report the conduct of Magistrate Michelle Henderson, who allowed a civil rapist in Alexandra to walk away, only to be arrested the same day because he had other cases of raping women involving seven other women. In Mpumalanga, Speaker, Kwam Klang, Obed Lushoro convicted murder of Naledi Lutoba was sentenced to 15 years with no clarity on parole eligibility. And a convicted rapist for who raped 55-year-old women was sentenced to five years in jail. These are but just a few cases that even when the Minister of Justice and the President, like the Minister of Police, Provincial Commissioner in the Eastern State, and the hospital officials, none of them care to find it in their hearts to intervene. The institutional, the institutional failures are deliberate, and part of the reason why perpetrators are not even bothered, they're not afraid to commit any gender-based violence because they know that those in power do not care and nothing will happen to them. Speaker, today I cannot breathe because I'm reminded of the Commission for Gender Equality that found that the women were forcefully sterilized, but to this day, no one has been held accountable because these are poor women. These are poor black women. It has to stop and it has to stop now. I thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mema Udre. Uh... Women are traditionally the heart of the homes. 
they nurture and they care for their families. Yet in South Africa, the home has become a battlefield for our women. The daily reports are just the tip of the iceberg detailing horrific, brutal acts of violence against women and children in our communities across the entire country. In South Africa, five times more women are murdered by their intimate partners than anywhere else in this world. This means that the people who are responsible for these crimes are often not strangers anymore, but the people who are supposed to trust and love these this women. Unfortunately, the living circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic have merely served to amplify the president. Uh, uh, president Ramaphosa himself has recently described as the second pandemic. Women and children have been forced by law by this government to remain inside their homes, a space where, according to the statistics of South Africa, 57.8% of women, of females are likely to experience assault. Then to add fuel to the fire with the dangerous repercussions of abuse and you have a, rec a recipe for disaster. According to the World Health Organization policy briefing, 44% of victims of interpersonal inter violence in South Africa believed that their attacker had been under the influence of alcohol. Then why do we ask ourselves, did the president lift the ban on alcohol on the 1st of June when the South Africa moved to level three under national lockdown? And yet still call for South Africans to remain confined in their homes with their abusive partners. Since the 1st of June, a police minister Pegetele reported an increase on murders and cases of gender-based violence. Further to this, the Western Cape Women's Shelter Movement reported that shelters for victims of gender-based violence filled up in a week following the lifting of the ban of alcohol. Almost daily, South Africans rate of yet another woman or a child that has been mutilated and killed. I do agree with my previous speakers and colleagues that enough is indeed enough. For far too long, gender-based violence has been making headlines and our government has been making empty promises in 2018, the hashtag total shutdown movement resulted in the 2018 presidential summit on the gender-based violence and femicide with, with, and femicide with an interim steering committee established in April 2019 to respond to the gender-based violence crisis, which eventually resulted in the publication of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide in 2020. We have the strategies in place, but there is no action. Where is the action? The time for consultation is over and conversation is over. The IFP calls on government to reconsider its regulations in relating, relating to the sale of alcohol. Ideally, the complete ban should be reinstated while South Africans are still living under the lockdown. Or more stringent regulations should be applied regarding availability and cost to alcohol. Regulating the price of alcohol might help to restrict the sales and access to alcohol. The IFP calls on government to to consider harsher sentences for perpetrators of gender-based violence, the punishment must be the, act of the crime and act as a deterrent, not just a slap in the wrist as we've seen before, as my fellow colleagues have already said. Possibly it might be a time to revisit the death penalty so that those that violently steal the lives of innocent women and children in our country have to forfeit their own lives. Honorable House Chair, the IFP calls on government, political parties, civil society, faith-based organization and all South Africans who refuse to stand by as, as this war on women and children in our communities take place to come together to fight this gender-based violence pandemic. The government's hashtag stay safe shouldn't just apply to COVID-19, but should also apply to gender-based violence and should be stay safe, stay safe and hashtag speak up. We need to end the culture of silence around gender-based violence so as to intervene before it is too late and our family, right. friends, neighbors, and colleagues become just another statistics. We appeal with you, uh, House Chair, we appeal with government to ensure that we take these matters seriously. It cannot be that each and every time parliament will be convened oh. to debate the, the, the issue of gender-based violence with no action. We want action now. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Numan. Akbara Lid Bridge. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh -huh. Thank you, Chairperson. We have become a country of intolerant, violent people. The only way South Africans know how to handle conflict is through violence. We shout and scream and break and burn and spew hatred and rape and murder. 
If we do not like a specific part in history, no problem. Let's break it down and make as if it never happened. If we find a specific language offensive, no worries. We'll just abuse its speakers and then villainize and ban it. A manager and co-worker that we do not like, no pain. We'll just murder the character. That is literally how South Africans deal with all its problems. And GBV is no different. But as with everything that turns violent in South Africa, it started out with a few specifically selected words of hatred and stereotyping. GBV also started with such words. It starts with a sexist joke around a braai or the borderline inappropriate comment of a colleague. It starts with a condescending an abusive way a man talks to a woman. It starts with words and it becomes that which we as South Africans know best, violence. But Chairperson, it is not only the South African citizenry that is to blame for this. It is also our government. Every single time our president addresses the nation, my fellow South Africans, followed by an emotional speech about the importance of women in our society, it creates a feeling of being seen. Every time the president continues to announce what plans we have to combat GBV, it creates hope. Every single time a committee sits and strategizes the way forward, it creates dreams of a better future. Just to be let down by empty promises, a circus of meetings, and an unjust justice system that is created to protect the perpetrators and not the victim. But let me tell you a true story of a very close friend of mine. Let's call her Susan for this. Susan is in a bitter divorce battle. She has been verbally, emotionally, and of late physically abused by her soon-to-be ex-husband. Last week, it reached breaking point, and in the middle of the night, she had to flee to a friend's house. In the morning, she went to a domestic violence court to file a protection order. Two days later, she receives a call from the police to inquire as to the whereabouts of her husband because they failed to serve the protection order. Another day passes and she once again receives a call from the police. This time, they request that she contact her husband for a copy of the protection order as they forgot to make one. Now, where's the sensitive sensitivity training the president announced all police officers received in that? And where is the prioritization by mandated magistrates courts when the magistrate refused to grant an eviction order of an abusive spouse to Susan just because the house is in the spouse's name. What will happen if the police take two days to react to a call from Susan when her abusive spouse contravenes her protection order? And will I be standing next to Susan's grave in a few weeks? And what will happen to the millions of Susans whom are similarly going through the secondary abuse perpetuated by government officials who are supposed to protect and to keep them safe. It seems that the onus is on us to protect ourselves and to protect ourselves from our greatest victimizers, our government. But Mr. President, you and the Minister of Police and the Minister of Justice, you are guilty of gender-based violence because you idly stand by and preach lip service to victims of these heinous crimes while you're supporting cannot manage to do their jobs properly, and you cannot see to it that they do. Chairperson, I thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. During last year's debate on gender-based violence, I reminded members of this house of a very concerning incident that, that took place in May of 2016 during a clash between EFF MPs and parliamentary security officers where a female security officer fell to the ground during the scuffle and was assaulted and repeatedly killed by some MPs. Presiding officers and members of the fifth parliament knew about this incident, but nothing has been done about it. Jefferson, it is a shame and a hypocritical for politicians to stand in this house to condemn gender-based violence while they turn a blind eye to it when it happens among them. If we as MPs are truly serious about fighting gender-based violence, then I urge members of this house to do the right thing by ensuring that justice is done for the assaulted officer and that those offending MPs are correctly and rightly punished. 
A few days ago, these frustrations led to a series of marches across the country with calls to bring an end to violence and femicide. The question is whether the government has the will to stop this scourge of GBP in a country. I'm not convinced it does. There are a number of incidences where some rape survivors, survivors would go to the police station to report their ordeal, only to be told, I quote, go home, don't watch, and come back the next day, close quote, as it has happened recently at the Kailicha police station. This is very concerning. While assurances of disciplinary action for such incidents are given, victims of rape always struggle to find justice. The ACDP calls on government to carefully examine and consider studies that have been conducted to investigate whether there is a link between gender-based violence, rape, and pornography. According to the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, based in Washington, D.C., an analysis of 30 most popular pornographic videos found that 88% of scenes contained physical violence and 87% of aggressive acts played out were perpetrated against women. Since 2011, there has been 40 peer-reviewed papers and 30 neurological studies which reveal that pornography has a negative and detrimental impact on the brain. Studies show that the more pornography a man watches, the more likely he is to request or demand that his partner perform a particular sex act he has seen. Exposure to porn contributes directly to the development of sexually dysfunctional attitudes and behaviors which include sexual deviant, deviant tendencies and committing sexual offenses. Chairperson, as long as pornography that objectifies women as sex objects is easily accessible in a country, gender-based violence and femicide will continue unabated. In addition, if gender-based violence that occurs on the parliamentary precinct is ignored, respect for this is esteemed house will ignore to diminish. The ACDP calls on this house to lead the fight against gender-based violence from the front and start setting a good example for all in South Africa to follow. Thank you. Uh, UDM, we have nobody for the UDM. I just want to confirm as we pass. Okay. And Dr. Ndombe. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, the next speaker on the, uh, is uh, Honorable T. Al Machau from the virtual platform. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable members of this <coughs> house, ATM would like to pass heartfelt condolences to the families of all victims of the ever rising gender based violence issue that has engulfed all of South Africa. We have told that at this point in time, after so many matches and many talks and summits, there would be a change in legislation, which ultimately dictates a change in communities at large. But that is not the case because we're still reporting many cases of gender-based violence. And with time, it gets worse. Perpetrators are just roaming the streets unbothered. How long must we bear the pain of getting the bodies of our granddaughters daughters, sisters, and grandmothers, mercilessly raped, bent, and disposed in garbage bins, and brutally killed. Enough is enough. This unfortunately prompts us to start looking into possible root causes of this injustice to women and children. And we cannot run away from the fact that the lack of resources is one of many contributing factors to the ever-rising statistics because the lack of resources prevents people from living with dignity. That is why we are calling the ring fencing of microeconomy for people of South Africa, where we are going to benefit as women and not relying on men for our survival. At the core of all its the exclusion of locals in participation in the economy to make ends meet, provide for their families, ensure that each and every citizen is economically plugged in some way that they literally have no time for criminal activity. In putting South Africa first, we must do away with ill culture of being sympathetic to perpetrators because it latently fuels the violence against women. If a prisoner is able to rape and kill prison, female waters in prison, 
while serving time for similar repeat crimes. Such a person cannot be protected by the right to life shield as enshrined in the constitution. A clear violation of human rights must be given similar attention and recourse. If a person repeatedly kills innocent, they are communicated that they do not want to coexist with other people and therefore must be subjected to the same fate. Hence, our call for justice-based capital punishment, which is tantamount to death penalty. By doing that, by saying those few words, we are saying enough is enough. And it is not for the first time we are calling for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The next speaker comes from Good, is the Honorable the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure. Honorable Minister, are you there? So sorry, Honorable Chair. Minister. Yes. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Gender-based violence is a disease that infects the whole of society. There is no vaccine. It requires a whole of society response. We need to get back to the beginning and establish a new value proposition and new societal norms. And the project begins in our homes and in our communities. We are blunting our boys' emotions and raising them to believe that gender-based violence is how strong men should express their power. We are training them to be soldiers to wage war against our women. And in doing so, we are perpetuating an ancient patriarchal framework that must change. Parents and guardians must lay the foundation for our children. They should know before they go to school that discrimination, whether it's based on race, gender, culture, or any other factor, is revolting and socially unacceptable. In South Africa, um, in South Africa, when a so sorry, Chair. in South Africa, Chairperson, when a uh, 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 another victim of femicide is, um, is, is on our news screens. We hear a lot of condemnation. There's a comp competition for who can make the most dramatic speeches. We convene workshops. We convene more conferences. But while at the the same time, the next victim is on the news. So, chairperson, we must learn to uh, to make sure that we include uh, gender equality in our school syllabus. And every single one of us has got a responsibility to contribute to treating this disease. As Minister of Public Works, I've signed an allocation of 12 properties in Gauteng and in the Western Cape for use as shelters for victims of gender-based violence with more properties in other uh, provinces to follow. The EPWP program has also recruited 319 workers so far across the 44 districts for municipalities to engage the our communities on GBV. Tomorrow, Chair, I will be meeting with all MECs for social developments in all nine provinces to implore on them the urgency and the collaboration needed to make this work and these and have these properties used for shelters for abused women and children. Chairperson, we shall overcome. We can no longer afford to wait. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, from the NFP, Honorable Sheikh Imam, from the visual platform. Can you hear me all chair? Can you hear me all chair? I can hear you, honorable yeah, member. Thank you very much. First of all, honorable house chair, you know, the National Freedom Party wants to give you some statistics. In the 2018-2019 here, 2,771 women and or children were murdered in South Africa. 
And how many times did you get political parties and leaders of parties or leaders that wanted to march and go and support those victims, maybe twice, maybe thrice for the entire year, despite there being 2,771 murders? There were 3,445 attempted murders. How many times did you have us leaders going and supporting them? None. There was 36,597 sexual assaults alone in that year. Did we get any leaders and political parties and politicians going and supporting them? No. Now the question that arises is, why is it we choose one out of every 1,000 victims and make a big thing and grandstand, but we allow the other 999 to go unnoticed. The problem in the country, honorable chairperson, is more than just an issue of an abuser abusing an abuse. Now, let me start off by saying, in the first week of the lockdown, the South African police services received 87,000 calls from frantic women that were being abused, which led to 2,300 complaints alone. Now, it's not just the policies and the legislation. And I want to say Honorable Mazzoni is correct that not all men are abusers. Let me pay tribute to my late dad who always said it was the man's responsibility to provide food, shelter, security, and clothing to women and children. Now, Respect for women, children, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, all should be equal. The problem we have is, why is society producing these rapists and these murders? Where have we gone wrong? Why have we gone wrong? When have we gone wrong? Now, these are the things we need to be addressing because every perpetrator out there is somebody's son. Every child that is being abused, a woman that is being abused, is somebody's daughter. And the question we must ask ourselves, right from parliament, as members of parliament, are we protecting our women and children? Are we leading by example? Women suffer physical, emotional, physical, as well, honorable chair, as economical abuse. How many of our men, because they are members of parliament, believe you can have girlfriend after girlfriend, you can have children all over, don't even maintain them. So I think the problem is bigger than just looking at legislation and policy. We need to change the way society thinks, the way they behave. We need to uplift the moral values in society. Thank, thank you, Honorable. So we need a holistic Man. approach to the, the, the problem of gender-based violence in South Africa. Thank you thank very you. much, Honorable Member. The next speaker is from the ANC, Honorable C. Malachi. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable members, we are faced with, with this dark, heavy cloud of apartheid infiltrating itself through gender-based violence in our communities. We see women, children, LGBTQ bodies being brutally abused day in, day out in South Africa. In the ways of Shimamanda Wozi, she envisions open code. I would like to ask that we begin to dream about and plan for a different world, a fairer world, a world where happier men and happier women who are true to themselves. And this is how it starts. We must start by raising our daughters differently. We must raise our sons differently. We must also, we must, we must address patriarchy in society in order to cap the continuous veil of gender-based violence and femicide incidences. Patriarchy remains one of the main drivers of gender-based violence. It is deep ingrained within the fabric of society to an extent that most women consider it a normal way of life. This must change. We need to collect, we need to collect a collective voice. We need a collective voice. The failure to do so will lead to many lives being lost to femicides. We cannot wait any longer to address the evil head of gender-based violence that keeps fight, finding expression in our communities. The report suggests that a number of gender-based violence increased by 500% since the start of COVID-19 lockdown. We we find it appalling that women continue to be killed and abused, mostly by people close to them. The COVID crisis has reinforced the problems faced by women in abusive relationships. Women become trapped with their abusers.
Blessing Honorable Malachi. Wow. So economic emancipation of women should be in the center of the work of government to ensure that gender equity in society. Our freedom will surely not be free without an emancipation of women in our lifetime. Honorable Nkomo, it is painful that a young pregnant woman who was full of life at a tender age of 21 years, named Chokofa Chokule, was brutally killed at the hands of a man who has no, no respect, no regard for life of women. Honorable Holomisa, in Kailisha, a 34-year-old Swongiseni, a 34 year old decomposed body was found chopped into pieces, stuffed inside a sports bag. Chaperson, it cannot be that 26 years since the inception of democracy, we still see hate crimes. All of these incidences are as a result of patriarchy like in society. They are happening right in our country, home province, schools, workplaces, not far from where many of us reside. There is a serious matter that should not be used. This is a serious matter that should not be used for cheap politicking. It cannot be a matter of lip service, sloganeering, but it must be a daily matter that must be dealt with in order to dismantle patriarchy. The youth should be at the forefront of implementing gender empowerment programs. It is high time the youth of today took the burden from the eldership of today, just like the youth of 1976, by correcting one another. There is a great call on more discussion to be on and offline on gender-based violence and femicide. It, is, it, is, it was quite important and necessary that both young and old men of this country went to the streets of Pretoria together with the Minister of Justice and Correctional Service, Honorable Rod Lamola, against gender-based violence. This is a step in the right direction. In the words of Thomas Sankara, open quote, comrades, there is no social revolution without the revolution of women. May my eyes never see, may my feet never take one, take me to a society where half of the people are held in silence. I see the role of women in silence. Women have shaken off the trickles of the past in the determined struggle against political and social economic oppression. Women have, in, have earned a place in the history books of this great nation. Women like Mama Winnie Mandela, Mama Sisulu, Mama Tambo, Mama Debray, and many other women. The sad reality today is that women still remain bound by shackles of patriarchy. We also need to task ourselves as the youth in ensuring that we educate and help those who have been misguided and taught patriarchal ways of living to unlearn and uh, to learn that they don't own women's bodies and that they have no entitlement to them. The culture of unlearning must happen as a national program, Honorable Chair. The, the, this call for all of us here to be in the forefront of dialogues in our communities. We should teach, we should teach our young men on how to behave. And our young men should be taught the nature of male privilege, the dangers of male privilege. But the responsibility must, not also, must also be placed on parents and guardians to stop being conservative and call out their sons when they see or hear them mistreat women. It must also be an important lesson to communities that they must not insult LGBTQI bodies. It must be a thing of the past that LGBTQI bodies must be protected and offended the same respect like any other person in society because LGBTQI does not mean you are less of a human being. That sick, homophobic mentality must be destroyed. Parents must be an example of guide, character, progressive, and respect to all marginalized people in society. I want to echo the release from a song by a young artist called Loiso. And if Honorable Josie was here, Today with us, I'll request him to sing it. It says, "My daughter Sabelan, hey my daughter Sabelan, hey my daughter Nandan, hey my daughter Sabelan, Abafaz Bali." This song echoes the call that men stand up, men must stop, men must stop killing women because 
We are, we are losing too many of our mothers, sisters, cousins because of this violence. We also call upon artists to use their social capital to influence society for, against social ills. I leave you all with the following words. The truth of the matter is that there is no woman who abuses, who abuses or kills herself. Thank this you is done by men. Sometimes no, and sometimes men who, who are not strangers. Sometimes yeah. men who are strangers. These the men are people who up. know. Yeah. These men, some of us here, who must fight against gender-based violence and homicide. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is from the IAIC, Honorable MP Galano. Is Honorable MP Galo around? Honorable MP Galo? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, sir. Exactly nine ago, the president convened a joint sitting in accordance with the provisions of both Section 84, subsection 2 of the Constitution and Rule 7, subsection 1b of the Joint Rules of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. It serves no functional purpose to rehash the president's speech, safe to say to mention some of the glaring gaps that occupied my mind to no end. For example, the president announced an emergency action plan, which was to look into, amongst others, the prevention or preventative gender-based violence strategy. Despite existing laws, programs and bills addressing the same issue. This existing regime includes the Victim Support Services Bill, which has been gathering dust, the National Tax Team on LGBTQI and gender-based violence, established in 2011, the Domestic Act 116 of 1998, Already in 2018, the president warned us in his 2019 gender-based violence address about 2,700 women and over 1,000 children died at the hands of another person. As mentioned, gender-based violence has continued despite the tight regime introduced years, years ago. The default position is that men are at the center of this violence, while the Minister of Police has noted, if we compare the period between 27 March to 21 May 2019 with the lockdown period from 27 March to 19 May 2020, there is a sharp decrease from 21,000 33,000 from 21, sorry, from 21,033 in 2019 to 6,000, six, to 6,651 cases of domestic violence during the lockdown, giving us a percentage decrease of 68.4%, we cannot ignore the scourge of this violence. We are confronted by the senseless meted out against gender-based violence perpetrators, including Herman Harker, who was handed a 15 Thank life sentence plus abduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do not have a speaker from COPE. And the next one is supposed to be the PAC. Don't have a person. Honorable House Chairperson, Honorable Magisha from COPE is in the house. She will take oh, the podium. Yeah. 
Honorable Magician. Welcome. Uh, thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. I think what we need to do is to start here and ask a question, a question that says, amongst all the political parties which are here present, who are the leaders? Who are the presidents? Who are the chairpersons at the national level, et cetera, et cetera? Who are the real big, big leaders in the parties? I say this because we always shall come here each and every time, rise and repeat the same thing, clap hands and go away. But there is no implementation right from ourselves. I must perhaps even go further and ask a question and say, how many amongst us are very clear, clean? I think we need to respond to that question ourselves here. Yeah. Please don't respond, but we ourselves, wherever we are seated and know. Next year, we shall come back. The same issue shall be raised. We shall clap hands and go and not implement. We must enforce the existing laws. They are there, of course, the existing policies. We are not ensuring that all those are implemented. I, I want to uh, say, I believe that this problem that we are faced today, in my own opinion, can be equal to COVID-19. Women are beaten up. They are faced with these horrendous uh, problems. We come to parliament, we say, this is wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But we ourselves are the people who go out and uh, keep quiet. We must enforce the, and protect uh, women from discrimination and violence, from rape and beatings, from verbal abuse and mutilations, from torture and human trafficking. Women must be provided with skills and training so that they can work. We must sensitize, or rather sensitize the public, all South Africans, that early and forced childhood marriages are wrong. We need to do that all ourselves. Instead of coming here and clapping hands, we must highlight the value of girls' education and women, women's participation in economic development. We must encourage women to participate in the political processes and educate the public about the value of women. We are not doing that. We must raise public awareness of the poor conditions some women face, particularly in the rural areas. I mean, I can go Thank on and give, Patricia. for example, here, uh, what has happened yesterday, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not going to assist. We must act. You members Thank of you, parliament. Thank you very much. The next speaker is from the PhD, Honorable Nata. I think it is, yes. Yeah. From the chamber. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. PAC believes that a society founded on injustice, exploitation, and the oppression of the African people will never be able to bring about justice to the issue of gender based violence and exploitation of women that we are currently facing where women are killed and abused by their partners and loved ones. Gender-based violence and the continued exploitation of women as laboring tools and societal beings within a capitalist, a capitalist system is a power play manifested through various relations of dominance, where the dominant power forces continue to subjugate and assert their position using the place within an exploitative justice society where men have placed themselves as watchers of humanity. The violence women experience is, is so potently public that eight months pregnant women are, vic are viciously murdered and found hanging on trees in the public sphere. Women are targets of rape, domestic abuse, sexual assault, 
and murder, where they are treated like trespassers in their homes, communities, and workplace, and general public. No African, no African woman or girl is safe in South Africa. Gender-based violence has become a gruesome theater played out on the bodies of girls as young as three weeks old and elderly women pensioners in their 70s and above. This violence has become so, has become so endemic, normalized, and is even celebrated, promoting behavior among young boys and men to initiate at a young age high levels of aggression at home, schools, and public spaces. This endorses ideas of dominance at a young age among men. It creates a violent culture where permission is given to train the boy child relating to the girl child to be different to this child. As PAC, we insist that the gender-based violence is not only a societal program, but a structured crisis as a result of a bloody, violent legacy of imperialism colonialism, patriarchy, and other forms of oppression all embedded in capitalism. The white ruling class with minority section of black males has continued to use its power through its control of the means of production. They have maintained this control, sanctioned by a government that is preoccupied with cosmetic changes, with no ambition or intention of with the core and fundamental antagonisms that breed violence, the altar of power within an exploitative and inequitable and unjust society is a ruthless dynamic that manifests through toxic masculinity, economic dependence on men, cultural dogma, and the emotional and physical humiliation of women. Despite the Double first democratic sorry. elections, before Thank we are back in with state where we live as long as more than day slaves. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The next speaker is the Honorable Hendrik from Al Jama. Thank Speaking you. Visually. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, today we got leadership from the EFF when they said that alcohol should be banned. I'm sure the previous speaker would agree that. Robert Shubukwe would have supported the EFF today. A study by the World Health Organization that revealed that 65% of women in South Africa who suffered abuse by the spouse were alcohol-related. The Child Safe South Africa also agreed that almost half of the country's domestic violence is related to alcohol. We've also been given leadership by the Honorable Chief Whip of the DA when she spoke about the absence and the need for sanitary pads. Uh, at school, when boys overpower girls and they smell, then they, then they abuse the girls uh, further. I, al would like to make a call for protection orders to be in the hands of accredited rabbis, priests, and imams so that women can get quick uh, assistance. Honorable Chair, at the uh, 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 at when we celebrated Africa Day, the uh, speaker of this honourable house called for a standby military force for Africa, and she said that at least one third must be women. I think she must make a call for a standby force in Parliament uh, to address the issues surrounding gender-based violence, and that force should be hundred. 100% uh, women. Parliament has started a mechanism in this regard, but uh, it must have some strength, and that's why we need to look at the standby force uh, uh, to, to assist. Honorable Chair, when the Mufti of Bosnia came to South Africa, uh, I, we asked him about the violence against women in Bosnia, and I had to give the answer to my mom who ran two safe houses in District 6 after the treason and the Ravoria trials. And this is the message the Mufti gave. He said, please don't depend on the men. They are going to let, let you down. Women must empower themselves economically. Women must be armed. Every woman must carry a gun. And women must protect themselves. So uh, I, 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 we were looking for solutions, Honorable Chair, and I think that the call to men 
to rise has been made so many times and it has fallen on deaf ears. Women must be empowered uh, to defend themselves, uh, honorable chair. When I was in Libya in 74, it was the women who was in charge of the street committees in Libya that brought, them up, brought about the economic transformation of Libya. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Hendrik. And the next speaker is from the DA, the Honorable N.K. Sharif. <laughs> It feels like we live in a society that hates women. You may disagree, and that's okay. But in the absence of kindness and empathy, all we are left with is hate. It will take more than a global pandemic to redesign the social fabric and dismantle the systems of oppression we currently find ourselves in. This social fabric is riddled with pain, trauma, and violence that has been built with a conscious decision to deliberately leave women out. We must rip up this invisible social contract we all seem to have signed unknowingly that tells women, and especially the girl child, that her life is expendable and that her value is determined by the sexualization of her body. I was caught off guard, but not entirely shocked when a young woman who matriculated last year told me how her teacher in high school called her a slut for wearing a skirt that was just a little shorter than what he deemed acceptable. No one, not even schools, should be dictating what girls wear. Schools oh, yeah. sexualize girls from a young age. This practice is not only damaging to girls and boys, but it has also set destructive precedents and a toxic relationship between a girl and her own body, where boys learn from a young age that wearing a short skirt is an invitation for abuse on a girl's body. Immediately after she said this, like a flood, memories of my own experiences in school came rushing back. Not only memories of how the school's code of conduct sexualized my body, but also the sexual harassment I experienced from male peers. Women learn the fact that from a young age, it is our responsibility to ensure that we don't get raped or sexually harassed. It is the girl's responsibility to take all precautions to keep herself safe as possible. Putting this immeasurable burden and pressure on her for the rest of her life, for the simple fact that she was born a girl. We must instead teach young boys not to sexualize her body. Respect for autonomy must be far reaching, understanding consent and basic equality must be prioritized in schools, at home, at the workplace, and any other space occupied by women. The fact of the matter is, honorable members, a woman grows up knowing her body is sexualized from the time she is born, whether she wants it to be or not. And this has lifelong consequences. From being told at a young age what she should wear and how she should carry herself, to even the most natural process of learning or trying to access information on how her body works, how to keep herself healthy, what choices she has over her body and what is normal and abnormal is seen as explicit content. Explicit content without an age restriction. Just last week, I was called out to a police station in Joburg South where the police refused to open a case because the survivor reported it a week after it happened. Minister Trele, the police refused to open a case for a rape survivor because she reported it a week after it happened. 
the South African police service cannot continue to remain complacent in the violence towards women. Why must it be that only when I, as an MP, intervened that the, that the survivor was only then assisted? I am telling you this because it, this is the reality of women in this country that is hated by society face every single day. The police in this country remain a barrier and far too often they contribute to second degree trauma. This was one incident, but there are many more. There are so many cases of violence towards women in this country and too many of them go unreported because they are intimidated by a system that is meant to protect them. In my thank closing you, words, I want to say, I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the Honorable the Deputy Minister of Justice and Correctional Services from the ANC. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members. A lot has been said about government failing to implement its own plans and promises. These are the facts. To date, 102 sexual offenses courts have been rolled out across all provinces, together with 55 to Tuzela pet centers. These specialized courts are equipped with upgraded technology to provide private testifying services, particularly for children, persons with mental disabilities, and traumatized witnesses. The Tuzela test centers which are one-stop care facilities based in hospital premises, provide support services for victims of sexual offenses with the aim to reduce secondary victimization. During the 2019-2020 financial year, 35,469 victims were assisted in these two to Zella care centers, with 31,807 of them being specifically in relation to sexual offenses. Six more of these sites are to be established in the current medium term expansion framework period. Furthermore, in line with the presidential summit declaration and the GBVF national strategic plan, the department promulgated the regulations relating to sexual offenses courts, which were gazetted on 7 February, 2020. The regulations set out support services intended to create a justice system that is quick, responsive, caring, and effective for victims of sexual offenses. In addition, the department drafted three bills which are aimed at keeping the scourge of violence against women and children under consideration are these. The Criminal and Related Matters Bill, which is to, among others, introduced stricter bail and sentencing provisions. The second one is the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill, which seeks to address the gaps and anomalies which have manifested them by, since the uh, promulgation of the Domestic Violence Act. The Criminal Law, Sexual Offenses and Related Matters Amendment Bill, which seeks to extend the protection afforded to victims of gender-based violence and to introduce a new offense of sexual intimidation and to extend the ambit of the offense of incest. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here in this august house yet again to talk about the subject which under normal human circumstances should not even be arising what an abnormal society. You are free, yet unfree. President Oliver Tambo of the ANC had the uncanny ability of stating the obvious in profound ways. He said, as long as women are not free, we could never claim to be free. This is an elementary truth. Women are the bedrock of every society. They are the mothers of any nation. Children are similarly the future of any society. It should be pleasing, therefore, for the eminent representatives of the nation to take time to call out on the people of South Africa to stop the edge, the scourge of an unwarranted assault on the mothers of the nation. We should all heed the call that gender-based violence is a societal matter 
that cuts across divides of politics, race, culture, class, and religion. I am familiar more with the values entrenched, yet distorted and abused in African cultures and traditions. I am ordained by the dictates of the cultural values of my father's people to interpret jurisdictionally and administratively how these are to be interpreted. Our culture, the African culture that is, is about the nurturing, the defense, and protection of the weak and the vulnerable. We do not have notions of, for instance, women being perpetual minors, deliberately or out of ignorance. The colonial invaders, whose legacy we continue to endure, decreed that women were minors, yet no man of reason regards himself as a dictator in his own house. In this regard, for instance, a homestead is referred to as the homestead of Mrs. Sorenso. It is never referred to as Mr. Sorenso's place. there's a there's a background noise. I'm sorry about that. I think it was I request the member to, to mute, please. You okay, honorable deputy minister. Okay. We born a Galiselo Tan on Gazimbo as a Kayo, it a ewe, flying a kufuni in Togaz. Our seven zisimant of Ponyamel. We are a Kayanga, it a boom of a new name, Ujule booms on Gazans. Our Zita tail and Ponyam Yako, Ogo Gutting Ogu and Gula. Ubu Zuang Lingala Elibi, Kango Uba Bafazi Bafunyel, Ukuba Bio Triangle. Indoja Zizi kebenga zeza pula mteto ezo. Ema zitatu njengezi juengu ezi zizizo. O mamu, manu makazi no tatuba uba mato mbazana. Asupeka. Mabatuka ni no mkogu sisi na gabandwa. Geliti baya bendisa ngogu benza batuwa. Uba befuna imali inku kwiku janengu omu ngeliti ilobolo. Pasteja ngelobolo masipumbu zane. Ukuba ilobolo aiteti kuti umfazi ya mtenga. Chenga kwa utengi nko muka nyimoto. Akasio ndo yako, ono kwenza nantoni nanga ayo. Ushale ngumtone nyama, numpefumlo njenga wendota. Faenga zivamu na anji, yeke, ati alunge. Akasi iso isikaga, kengi kelulo na kobo galako. Nisoni, banba kuti mabatuka nukusela izuengu. Yelitu mtimbi mautetwe isi kikaya. Genga yentoni, so kushaze kakomzi. Ubu zwengu, asio ndio kutotwa isi kaya. Uba lichala elikulu, elenzu wanga matoba, elenzu waku matoba, anga kwa ziyo kuzitanganise. Pasi solu sa makwengu, esuenza matoja. Masukinsegi ise ukuba ingu ibi na makangati, esu waketa yunga bandu wa banyulu, haba waziyo msebenzu waibu, Makunga tet ketwa amangila izi juengu. 
nabanda bazi ngambi uba abazu kwa azi uguba nika inga ikaesu wa nile kile ya utabese sikipini inga ikaesu yolwa luko ito liswe kwa kena matota ana aza kubalulu uto kuma wabu na sesizwe ama kwa ala kufuneka babi ngabanda batobe ikileyo abano bulali intobego nembeko abanda batobe ikileyo abano bulali intobego nembeko abanda batobe Basonela oni na utate wabu na bubonke ya bantu basichini. Banga bakuse ilikubo. Hai, abasugumezi babu. Nizi zimbezi nga tanda uuzitete, zinga mkele kanga, kwenta lukantu. Kambi kresha alisifu meli. Bazali, bazini ya bantu wanabinu wapu wakoyo. Kao onge ya makresha. Wazina makwengu ambisana na abu. Masashuka nesisazi na mtanji malunga begegle. Kukubali kona linye isiko elikutaza kukupatwa kwa kubi kwa bandu ababu tataka kuna banye. Ticho mnanku, hee lile ntalifa. Nye ntalifa ingena kwezikita nguzika ise kukuze ikubele pambili no kukulisa mzwa kukwai. Yonze usa poluka ise. Ili kusele kwenko itelo zobumi. E kufanele boluke, ntalifi ya bolus. E kufanele batonji iswe, ntalifi ya batombis. Ekufani lebende, kintalifa ya bendis. Umsebezu wayo, ukuzi inumzu mile. Kanye ngala antela umninimzi, waili ndeleke ukuba enze ngayo. Mayama sikuwa chumisi. Ah, kilezi nda. Oh, ya ble. Ya ble. We now come to the Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, the Honourable Minister, to close the debate. Honourable Leche, respected members um, of this August House, is Shangan Variti I Belletin Levain, those who came here okay no translation um this matter that has been debated so much so many mothers daughters grandmothers children that we've lost makes us to really as we do today say we are ashamed and where we come from women youth and people with disabilities, they are tired. I'm also tired of this debate. And luckily today, I come with colleagues from cabinet to share with members of the August House as to what efforts is government taking. But I wanted to just remind the August House uh, of a truly a, a parliament that is truly generation, generationally mixed, that this one is linge. It's for all of us. This challenge that came long before COVID-19, it's for all of us to tackle, starting from home. All of us here have some place called home where we raise boy children and girl children the way they should be Masupatela as Sulu in the true sense and the true and deserving benefactors of the sweat and blood of our heroines and heroes who fought for freedom for this country. The last being O.R. Tambo, the late president of the African National Congress, who in a conversation with the former president of Namibia said, they will never consider South Africa and Namibia free until the women of the two countries are free. I don't believe women of South Africa are free. Women of South Africa no longer feel safe, yes, you said, even in their bedrooms or starting in their bedrooms. In this June, in the middle of a pandemic that is, uh, you know, 
marauding the entire globe. South African women felt triply should change again by poverty, unemployment, and by being women, to by the pandemic, which found them already being slaughtered like sheep in their own homes. So the zeal with which we want to give to fighting COVID-19, may we, all of us, men and women, in particular, the progressive men, make sure that city one head, enough is enough. We are not going to have another high level where men think they can be passengers. Enough, it's enough. Um, the speakers before me here were asking, since the uh, adoption of the National Strategic Plan, what has been happening? President had appealed to all departments to, to trim off or set aside 1.6 billion to work on the emergency response action plan, which developed uh, on the basis of this uh, six months. One is access to justice for victims and survivors. Two, change norms behavior through high level prevention efforts, but society, where we come from. This is not black, this is not white, this is not political. Women in South Africa are under siege and this must change. Three, that we urgently respond to victims and survivors of gender-based violence and femicide. Police and everybody. It should be the last time that we sit here in this parliament chair and hear of how a raped woman must go, you know, walk, you know, between her legs, protecting the cement of a molester until the following day. Or the things that uh, the honorable member from the DA was saying, these things are painful. I have met with many, many victims. I have been to a home a very poor home here, just outside uh, Mamilodi, yesterday, where a husband killed a wife and disappeared for four days. And the mother, the poor mother, got to know that the mother, that her daughter was killed when the stench in this winter started coming out. So women are not bedeviled with the, this uh, challenge of uh, COVID-19. But under lockdown, just in June alone, more than 30 women were slaughtered at home. I think uh, Honorable Minister Delil spoke to the shelters that uh, they are trying to support us with. But yes, if these mothers who love and decorate their homes and bring up their children refuse to go to, to get out and save their skins, and try and protect those uh, homes, they will be killed. So they are not raping themselves. They are not the perpetrators. They are victims or survivors, but are they, they must still leave, you know, the bull in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the house and go to a shelter. This is not done in a self-respecting uh, country the number one economy in South Africa. In the past, it used to be uh, women who don't have it all. But even women who are educated, who have good jobs, it starts even with those who work for government. This thing is no longer a joke. It must end now with the support from government. Government and society. Let me share with you uh, the outcomes of this of some of these interventions, which uh, Honorable Holomisa spoke to some uh, from justice. Uh, evidence collection kits are now 
available in many of the police stations where they were not. But I agree, I cannot attest that they are in all police stations. But we have been working with Minister uh, uh, in the committee the president has formed, in the interministerial committee, after the adoption of the uh, uh, NSP to make things better. But the last time I had a conversation with him in tears, he was saying, now he is being asked to put a policeman next to every bedroom. So I think we need to look at that. Uh, assault and DNA uh, reference for the purpose of effective pe uh, prosecution should be accelerated. Forensic uh, sciences laboratory system uh, enhancements allows uh, for progress on gender-based violence and femicide cases to be automatically reported weekly. Regional courts were upgraded. I think I don't have to waste your time on that. You had the uh, Justice Department has three bills uh, in Parliament now for consideration, which includes all the, uh, 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 the uh, challenges that we raised for earlier on. Family violence, justice, which are children and sexual abuse offenses and units uh, strengthened as 312 policemen, we need more, were trained and deployed to in a police station that a victim that is not expected to be looking for help, but they should be looking for helping them. The cold case task team was established on the 1st of October 2019, and since that, 785 for uh, 1,481 dockets relating to sexual offenses are being considered. Gender-based violence and femicide sensitive, uh, sensitive training uh, targeting law enforcement officials, prosecutors, magistrates, policymakers, and media houses was commenced and is ongoing. More than nine buildings, uh, thanks to Minister uh, Patricia Dillil refurbished and handed over to be used as shelters, working together with the Minister of Social Development. 650 social workers at new were approved and placed, trained, approved, and, and placed uh, to provide psychosocial support services. We also established and upgraded five new I lost the minister. Are we are we disconnected? Unmute. Unmute. I have lost the minister. I'm sure she's almost done. Am I, am I audible now? You are audible, Minister. You can go ahead. Okay. Since uh, November 2019, uh, 12,747 government officials have been vetted against non national register for sex offenders. We have launched a social a behavioral ch a change a program for children between the ages of 10 and 14 with focus to enhance uh, services of, to vulnerable children and reduce incidence of HIV and AIDS uh, and molestation amongst children and adolescents. We held district men's parliaments as part of the boys and men championing change uh, programs, which is implemented under Tawani Rime Men's Movement. And many others are coming, and they are welcome. Because, yes, as President said, women don't rape women. Women don't kill women. 
So we appeal to all peace-loving and caring fathers and uncles in this parliament to join men's organizations and help make South Africa look better tomorrow. Illegal liquor outlets were closed, 310 of them. But even the legal ones need to take responsibility. So we are taking advantage of this. Before can we have a total shutdown on liquor outlets? Can they also join in, in campaigning that there is drinking that is responsible and that liquor should not become a menace in our country? Number 16, we, multifunctional teams have been established at the selected courts to work together towards creating victims centric in, in selected provinces, Badi, Eastern Cape, Free State, Gauteng, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and Northwest. As part of the emergency response, a, a mass media campaign targeting all public domains that are also focused on men's groups and formations of offenders in prisons and youth uh, has been also introduced. Resources, uh, audits of existing to care centers in all our provinces were completed. Uh, Chair, a 365 days sustained campaign to prevent and condemn the scare of a, a violence against women and children and femicide was launched by government in partnership with our civil society organizations, uh, particularly uh, Women's First and the United Nations. An audit, on, uh, it, uh, an audit of designed health facilities was conducted in all provinces and finalized. Additional health facilities were established in Northwest, Mpumalanga, Gauteng, and other uh, provinces. Comprehensive sexual education dialogues to shift um, attitude where early childhood education should also be considered seriously. I know that cabinet colleagues and deputy ministers during recess will be going throughout the country into the districts to make the district development model a reality. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you very much, sir. As we talk of COVID-19, we will also be saying... Thank you so much. That, honorable members, concludes the debate. We now move to the second order. The secretary will read the second order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services on notices determining remuneration of public protector and commissioners of South African Human Rights Commission with the effect from 1 April 2019. Thank you. I now call upon the Honorable H. Mahomet from the Chamber. Thank you, House Chair. In a letter dated the 26th of March, 2020, the President requested the National Assembly to consider the notices determining the salaries and allowances payable to office bearers of independent institutional institutions with effect 1 April, 2019. On the 8th of April, 2020, the matter was referred to the committee for it to consider the proposed determination of salaries and allowances payable to commissioners of the Human Rights Commission and to the public protector with effect 1 April 2020. Section 2.2 of the Public Protector Act read, read with section 17 of the determination of remuneration of office bearers 
on independent constitutional institutions, Laws Amendment Act 2014, provides that the public protector is entitled to such salary allowances and benefits as determined by the president from time to time by notice in the Gazette after taking into account the recommendations of the independent commission. Section 9.1 of the South African Human Rights Commission Act, as well as Section 2.3 of the Public Protection Act 1994, provides similarly with respect to the salaries and allowances and benefits of the full and part-time commissioners of the South African Human Rights Commission. Section 9.5 of the South African Human Rights Commission Act also requires the president to submit a notice uh, to the assembly, to the National Assembly for approval, whether whole or in part, or disapproval before the publication. Having taken into account the serious economic challenges that the country faces in the constrained fiscal environment, the president proposed a salary freeze of for office bearers earning 1.5 million per annum uh, or above, and 2.8 uh, percent adjustment for office bearers earning between 1 million and 1.5 million per annum, uh, a 4.8 5% adjustment for office bearers earning below 1 million rand. Our chairperson concerning the proposed commencement date, namely 1 April 2019, the committee is of the view that the date does not comply with section 2B of the Public Protect Act 1994 and section 94 of the South African Human Rights Commission Act 2013. As already more than a one year has passed without the notice having been published in the Gazette. The committee therefore proposes that before the notices are published, the proposed commencement date of 1 April 2019 be amended to 1 July 20, 2020, 2019 in order to comply with the provisions of uh, as mentioned. As chairperson, we therefore recommend, the committee could recommend that the National Assembly resolve to approve the notices determine the remuneration of public protector and the commissioners for Human Rights Commission with the condition that the president amends the commencement date before publication of the notices in the Gazette on 1 July 2019. The report is submitted for consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable member. <clears throat> Requests for declarations of vote have been re received. I will now allow one member of each political party wishing to make a declaration an opportunity to do so. DA is welcome. House Chair, uh, we support this report and the determination made by the President on the remuneration of the Public Protector, a Deputy, and the Commissioners of the South African Human Rights Commission. However, it is a concern that the manner in which the remuneration of public office bearers have been dealt with over the re recent years has now resulted in determinations being finalized in respect of these constitutional office bearers more than 12 months after the date on which these remuneration adjustments were to take effect. House Chair, in addition, it is so that of course the temptation will be there to say that if the National Assembly endorses this determination, we will be in approving increases for these office bearers amidst the biggest financial downturn this country has seen since the Great Depression. But not to approve will, will have the consequence that these office bearers will be the only ones in respect of whom the President made a determination which this House will not give effect to. Secondly, to not approve will have the practical effect of us failing to uphold Section 9 of the South African Human Rights Commission Act and Section 2 of the Public Protector Act, which respectively determines that the remuneration and service conditions of the Human Rights Commissioners may not be reduced or adversely altered, and that the public protector may not be remunerated less than a judge. However, what must be added is that while COVID-19, along with the last 12 years of financial mismanagement, has brought our country to the edge of the fiscal and financial abyss, we as a parliament cannot escape the duty to look afresh, <laughs> yes, from the so-called zero base at all those human rights institutions which report to us. Our constitution provides that amongst the institutions which are to, which are to support and strengthen our democracy, will be the public protector and the South African Human Rights Commission. 
That should be our zero base. Therefore, Chair, at this point in our history, we must, as a matter of urgency, and before the term of the current Human Rights Commissioners expire in 2024, once and for all process what we all know as the Carter asmal report. In light of the current economic climate, we should seriously consider whether it, whether it can be justifiable not to act on the primary recommendation made by the ASMAL report to rationalize the number of human rights bodies in South Africa into a single body. For this parliament not to be the proverbial roaring lion that ultimately kills no game, we must act on an urgent basis, informed by the harsh reality that we as a country can no longer afford the luxury of having, in addition to the Human Rights Commission, a commission for gender equality, a commission for the promotion and protection of rights of cultural, religious and linguistic communities, a pan-South African language board, and a national youth development agency. I'll share towards the end of the fifth parliament, the Office of the Institute Supporting Democracy started this, the process of, of uh, looking into the recommendations of the ASMA report. Unfortunately, an interim report which tabulated divergent views on whether it was socially and politically desirable to set up a single encompassing human rights commission was the only product of its work. In the years to come, desirability can no longer be the determining factor on this issue. We must take our cue from the Minister of Finance who recently said, when the, we thought we were rich, we would do things in a way. We are no longer as rich as we used to think we are, and therefore we, we must adapt to the new situation. House to be, Chair, this new situation burdens us. No, it urgently enjoins us with the responsibility to give effect to the ASMAL report. And we plead that the House Chair and the Speaker takes this into serious consideration. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Hon. Uh, the next should be IFP, but can I check, is the EFF wanting to make a declaration? Okay, if not, we can go to the IFP, the Honorable Musiman from the virtual platform. No, it's the Honorable Fanamarba, I'll speak on his behalf. I'm in Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. You can go ahead. Well, I think I hear the Honorable Simang's voice, so you can proceed. Sorry, House Chairperson. I thought oh, he had okay. connection issues. Uh, Honorable Prof. <laughs> he was Honorable Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. And honorable members, the IFP has considered in the Portfolio Committee of Justice and Correctional Services the report on notices this, uh, uh, determining the remuneration of public protector and commissioners. and uh, commissioners of the South African Rights Commission with effect from the 1st of April, 2019, dated 19 June, 2020, and supports the recommendation made therein. Honorable members, we are all painfully aware of the fact that South Africa faces dire economic challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the Minister of Finance's supplementary budget speech delivered last week, we were told that the economy is expected to contract by 7.2% in 2020. This will be the largest contraction in nearly 90 years. We are also facing a consolidated budget deficit of 761,7 billion rand. This translates to 15,7% of the GDP in 2020-2021. This stark reality has to inform the National Assembly's con consideration 
of the report at hand. Honorable members, before turning to the report, we submit that this stark reality will inevitably also impact the operations of our Chapter 9 institutions. These institutions strengthen our constitutional democracy and <coughs> institutions, uh, institutions such as the Auditor General, the Office of the Public Protector, and the Human Rights Commission are critical investigating corruption and human rights abuse. Honorable members, these unprecedented times triggered emergency procurement procedures which undeniably created ample opportunity for corruption. Now, more than ever before, these critical constitutional institutions will be called on to guard against the abuse of state resources and enforce accountability and transparency. Good As afternoon, the, um, good evening, comrades. The recent events in South Africa call for the establishment of an integrity commission to investigate at high level corruption in the public service. Unfortunately, our calls have been unheeded. Honorable members, turning to the report, the IFP accepts the president's determination that in light of the serious economic challenges, it has been decided Honorable. that there will be Honorable. one a salary uh, <coughs> freeze for Honorable. office bearers earning 1.5 million rand and above. Two, a 2.5 salary adjustment for office bearers earning. Honorable Msimang. Thank you very much. The next in line is the ACDP. Honorable Swartz. Thank you, House. Thank you, House Chair. Chairperson, the ACDP supports the report. The determination of remuneration of office bearers on independent constitutional institutions, Law Amendment Act, which came into operation last year, was to set out a uniform standard for salaries, allowances, and benefits for the various institutions, such as the Public Protector, Auditor General, etc. And so this would be the first determination in terms of that Amendment Act. And as we know, the Independent Commission gazetted its recommendations in 12, uh, 13 February after a full consultative process. However, after consideration, the State President Ramaphosa adjusted the recommendations in view of the severe financial challenges which the country faces. And the ACDP has a full appreciation of those fiscal constraints and supports the adjustment. Now, the complication referred to by other members is that the one-year period prescribed had basically elapsed. And this raises an important issue relating to the time delay from when the commission makes the recommendation to when the president decides and when it gets to parliament. And it affects judges, it affects members of parliament, it affects these institutions as well. And following the legal opinion, the committee decided to amend the date from which the notice will take effect from namely 1 April to 1 July. And the legal advisors also pointed out that there could be a need to amend the legislation and that is something we need to consider. And we also need to express our, our gratitude to the parliamentary legal advisors who provide opinions to various committees on very short notice. Thank you very much. So while the ACDP regrets the delays in the finalization of these issues, we will support the report. Hopefully next year, the process will be expedited, but it must be emphasized that this is backdated. This is not a new increase. This has been backdated to next year. And given the financial constraints, we also support calls for the rationality, uh, the rationalization of various chapter nine and other commissions follow the Cater Asthma report. This is something we need to look into given the fact that there is no <coughs> physical space to move. Thank you, 
Honorable Swan. The show that we are paying for him. Honorable members, please mute your mic. I hope Honorable Swartz is done. And I'll call I've completed, Honorable, thank you. Have you completed? Thank you so much, Honorable Swartz. Uh, we now call the NFP, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The note, National Freedom Party notes the report that is tabled here. And indeed, the National Freedom Party supports this. The concern of, for the National Freedom Party particularly is the delay in processing this and ensuring that this notice is published. Uh, yes, I think it is very important to note that this needs to be backdated because it's well over a year. We do appreciate that the current financial situation in the currency warrants us to relook at particularly increases. And I think that goes around not only with Chapter 9 institutions, but of all public servants, given the situation we have with COVID-19. The president has recommended the freezing of, of, of some increases and limiting some of the others. Uh, and, and we do understand and appreciate that the prerogative lies with the president uh, based on recommendation from the uh, commission. Uh, the National Freedom Party has absolutely no problem. We also support the fact that this will now be amended to, to accommodate the delay, which will now be effective from the 1st of July 2020. But I think what is very important that in future, there ought not to be any delays in terms of processing this. But very importantly, I think, like I've said before, is that we need to look at the issue of limiting increases as much as these institutions are very, very important and vital, uh, particularly the Office of the Public Protector. And we know the work that has been done, including the, the, the Office of the South African Human Rights Commission. But I think what is very important, given the tight fiscal space we face in this country at the moment, all increases in future, we need to have a real look. But the National Freedom Party supports this in principle. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, in the absence of any other party wishing to make a declaration, can I call the ANC, Honorable Neville Drutan, from the visual platform? Honorable Neville. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, members of the House, fellow South Africans. The month of June bears great significance uh, in the history of our country. Uh, Among all the events we commemorated this month, uh, we commemorated uh, our 60th. Uh, what are member? Uh, House Chairperson. Yeah, I'm sorry to. I'm sorry to disturb the honorable member on the platform, but Honorable Njaisa is in line and he's waiting to be recognized before Honorable Dr. Drachen, Nivo Drachen. Okay, okay. Honorable Drachen, could you please give, let's give Honorable Njaisa, we're sorry about that. No problem, Chief. Honorable Chaisa. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, Honorable Chaisa. Honorable Chaisa. You, you, you're gone now. Can you hear me? You, we can hear you. Go ahead, Honorable Chaisa. I was saying, Chairperson, the notices from the president for the determination for the renovation of public procurement and convention for South African Human Rights Commission were well considered by the committee. Of course, this was done in accordance with the law. As African Independent Congress, we support the approval of payment of these salaries and allowances to these to these heads of the department, rather of these important institutions. Of course, we are aware of the suggestion by the committee that this should start from the 1st of July 2019. That is good because there were delays. We are also aware of the decline in our economy. So the president is aware, hence these percentages now. So we do appreciate it that the president is also aware because there's no increase in his salaries. 
We hope that this will serve as a motivation to these uh, office bearers. They should be equal to the task because they should work harder. Hence, they've been motivated under these difficult times. So thank you very much, Chairperson. We support the report and approval. Thank you very thank much, you. Honorable Jaisa. Thank you. From the ANC, Honorable Velma Drucken from the Visual Platform. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, members of the House, and fellow South Africans. <clears throat> the month of June bears great significance in the history of our country. Among all the events we commemorated this month, we commemorated the 65th anniversary of the signing of the Freedom Charter. The clarion call was made that the people shall govern. In keeping with that spirit, on behalf of the African National Congress, we rise in support of the report of Portfolio Committee on Justice and Cor Correctional Services on notices determining remuneration of public protector and commissioners of Sorry. South African Human Rights Commission. Sorry, uh, Honorable Hello, Doctor. There is a point of order from the House. Thank you very much, Chair. We request, if possible, that uh, we see a member Honorable Velma, and uh, the interpreter, we can li listen to the interpreter, but want to see the member, please. Okay, Honorable Chief. Can I continue, Chair? Uh, we, the, there is a request that a member should be seen Thank you very much. Here is Dr. Velma. Honorable member, you can go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Notices. Okay, the Constitution defines South Africa as a constitutional democracy and spells out how the state institution should function expressly to give effect to this constitutional democracy. These institutions are the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, and the chapter nine institutions in support of our democracy. <clears throat> this constitutional arrangement confirms and entrenches the system for which the ANC had fought for many decades, that the people shall govern. The determination of remuneration of public office bearers amended act seeks to give effect to section 219 of the constitution, which deals with the remuneration of public office bearers. Section 219 of the constitution states that national legislation must establish a framework for determining the salaries, benefits, and allowances of judges and public, the public protector and the auditor general and members of any commission provided for in the constitution. The Amendment Act remains the relevant legislation to provide for a uniform procedure to be followed in respect of the determination of the remuneration, benefits and allowances, and other terms and conditions of employment and services. It states that they will be entitled to such remuneration, benefits or allowances as the case may be, as determined by the President from time to time by notice in the Government Gazette, after taking into consideration the recommendations of the Independent Commission for the Remuneration of Public Office Bearers. The Independent Commission must consult the Cabinet members responsible and the Cabinet member responsible for finance. Notice must be approved by Parliament, which must by resolution, either approve the notice in whole or in part, or disapprove the notice. A notice in terms of subsection 1A of the Act, or any provision thereof, may commence with effect from a date specified in the notice, which date may not be more than one year after the date of publication of the notice. In this regard, we approve the 
notice with effect 1 July 2019. In light of the economic crisis, which has been exasperated by COVID-19, South Africans should note that this salary adjustment is a retrospective increase for the previous financial year and not a new increase in, the fun in this financial year. The Public Protector and the South African Human Rights Commission, along with all institutions supporting democracy, are critical for the functioning of our democracy, constitutionalism, but most importantly, giving effect to the call that the people shall govern. The ANC supports the report. Thank you, Chief Wilson. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Are there any objections to the approval of the notices determining remuneration of the public protector and commissioners of the South African High Human Rights Commission with effect from the 1st of April, 2019? No objections agreed to. We now move to the third order and uh, I will hand over to the Honorable Cedric Florek. Thank you, House Chairperson. I now request the Secretary to read the third order. Consideration of reports of Portfolio Commission Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs on petition from the residents of Boxburg, Ikululeni, Metropolitan Municipality, calling on the Assembly to investigate the numerous power outages submitted by Mr. M. Waters, and petition from the residents of Germiston, Ikululeni, Metropolitan Municipality, calling on the Assembly to investigate the numerous, numerous power outages submitted by Mr. M. Waters. A member of the committee will introduce a report. I recognize the Honorable Mpumza from the chamber. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, uh, and uh, Honorable Members. Chairperson, uh, on the 26th of August, 2019, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Honorable Faith Mutambi received a letter from a member of DA, Honorable Michael Waters, in relation to the petition from the residents of Boxburg, a municipality calling on the assembly to investigate numerous power outages and a petition from the residents of Boxburg, calling on the assembly to investigate numerous power outages uh, that had uh, occurred at uh, Glen Murray substation as a result of fire and the uh, subsequent outages to the residents, leaving almost the residents with six days without electricity, five days without electricity. The commission, the committee having mandating powers to oversight the executive and the local government sphere of government convened the city of Tswane on the 3rd of December, 2019, and engaged on this matter. And in the deliberation that had followed with the city of Tswane, the committee was briefed that uh, the substation is one among the oldest in the country, as far back, dating far back as uh, 1939, the outbreak of the Second World War. And this result, maintenance is being done and refurbishment. And uh, to that extent, the, the municipality had been able to make repairs within seven days. And uh, then deliberation also ensued whether the city would compensate uh, residents who had lost food as a result of wastages because of upset of the city. But also the committee recognized that uh, uh, such compensation, there is no precedence, and therefore is not provided in the budget. Uh, the committee recommended that uh, the city of Swane should investigate 
should must conduct a further investigation research and report to the committee on the state of people connecting Fundry Peak Park and Spartan. And secondly, city that the city must report on the city of Ebrurene. Oh, the city of Ebrurene, a regarding uh, the criminal prosecution for two officials involved in this case of public end, of the federal line. We submit uh, the report for consideration. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Chief of the Majority Party. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. House Chair, I move that the report be adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chief. There is request for declaration or vote. I will now recognize the Honorable Waters on the virtual platform. Thank you, Chairperson. There is no doubt that the city of Ikurulani is gripped by an electricity crisis. If anyone was in doubt what an incapable state looks like, they only need to come to Ikurulani to find out. Many people don't know the size and economic importance of the city. The amount of electricity distributed by Ikurulani is approximately the demand of four of our neighboring countries, namely Namibia, Mozambique, Botswana, and Lesotho. The city is also home to our largest airport, Oa Tambo. As far as the economy is concerned, Ikuruleni contributes 8.1% to the national economy and almost a quarter of Gauteng's economy. And put another way, the city is the fifth largest contributor to the national economy. Despite the economic and strategic importance of the city, the electricity department has systematically over several years been stripped of electricians and technicians so much so that there are now only 951 staff within the entire department. If one compares this to Etiquini, for example, who have a st staff establishment of 1,700, and to that of the city of Cape Town, whose staff est establishment is 2,787. One can see why the city of Ikuleni is gripped by an electricity crisis. Given the chronic shortage of staff and the lack of basic maintenance, it is not surprising that Ikuruleni experiences, on average, 1,570 unplanned power outages per day. That's right, Chair, you heard me correctly. 1,570 unplanned power outages per day. Not per week, not per month, but per day. This is crippling industries and businesses across the city. And as the industrial hub of the country, we can ill afford these outages. Every hour of outage is estimated to cost 1.6 billion in lost economic output. The report from the Portfolio Committee states that there were 383 recorded power outages alone in the Wadeville industrial area recently. For those of you who know the East Range, you will know that Wadeville is a strategic industrial area employing hundreds of thousands of people. The inability of the city of Ikuruleni to keep the lights on and the machines producing is resulting in people losing their jobs. I need not remind honorable members that the extended definition of unemployment is sitting at a staggering 39.7% or 10.7 million people. Given the enormity of the unemployment crisis, one would think that the city would do all in its power to keep the lights on and keep people in work. Another concern is the city's inability to tackle illegal connections, which is rife across the city and causes substations to trip or blow up. However, there is little or no political will to address this emergency. Another example of the lack of political will is the recent budget that was passed by the city last week, where, for example, the amount budgeted towards the maintenance of medium voltage networks was actually reduced and not increased. And we all know that the mayor of Ikuruleni a few weeks ago, came out in support of the EFF leader's call to let the white econo economy collapse. It seems the mayor is taking this call to heart by crippling industries across Ikuleni through the non-supply of electricity. What he and his coalition partners do not understand is that any business that closes will force more people into the unemployment queue, black, white, colored, and Indian alike. Unemployment does not discriminate, however, the mayor does. The residents of Germiston and Boxburg have quite frankly had enough of sitting in the dark and smelling their food rot. The industries of Germiston and Boxburg are at a breaking point. 
Some have already closed their doors and many others are contemplating it as the situation is unt untenable. My colleague, Honorable Michelle Clark, has written to Nissa in February this year, highlighting the unacceptable situation in her constituency of Germiston and asking them to investigate. We are still waiting for them to reply. What is needed, Chair, is political will, which, which there is very little coming from the ANC coalition in, in Ukuleni. It is time for the residents of Ukuleni to take back their power. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker Honourable is... Before yes, you continue, yes. I am advised, yes, I am advised to clarify uh, with respect to order number two for the the order number two that was adopted for by the house is the report of the justice committee in its entire entire entirety with the the recommend its recommendation so that we have the correct records uh, honorable chair thank you no well, thank you house chairperson and thank you for the correction i now recognize the speaker from the eff the honorable Langwini. Uh, uh, thank you, House Chair. House Chair, it's uh, Nazir Paulson. I'll be presenting the declaration on behalf of the Honourable Mzlanguini. Chairperson, the crisis of power outages is not only a problem facing industries and residents of Boxburg and Germiston. This is the experience of many households, especially in townships and rural areas, and it has been like this for many years. Our people are so used to living without concern consistent and uninterrupted supply of electricity, this despite the promise of electricity. In Boxburg and Germiston, what is sad is that the majority of those who suffer these power outages do not have alternatives and the city has failed horribly. What is even more concerning is that the outages are sometimes planned and targets the poor and the working class, even during COVID-19 and the lockdown. The white and affluent suburbs are seldom subjected to the same inconvenience of outages. The residents of Boxburg and Germiston don't need political speeches and meaningless reports. They need consistent, uninterrupted supply of electricity. We have made proposals before on what needs to happen for consistent supply of electricity. Take away the function of electricity take away the function of electricity and put it back with ESCOM. ESCOM must not outsource maintenance of electricity, power lines, substations, and all other infrastructure. It must build internal capacity. All TVET colleges, universities of technology, and universities should have joint programs to train and deploy artisans, electricians, and engineers. We should not have any young person who went to school who learned to be an artisan engineer or electrician who is unemployed when there is so much work that needs to be done. As we speak now, Chairperson, there are young people in Boxburg and Germiston loitering the streets, unemployed, but we have an aging electricity infrastructure, a society with young people who are not willing to work, educated and capable, but sitting at home will have high levels of crime and, and theft of infrastructure we need to get our people to work. We need ESCOM to have a model where they will employ young people to do the work of the organization. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. Next speaker is the Honorable Majosi from the IFP on the virtual platform. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. At the outset, I wish to thank the Honorable Mike Waters for raising the issues that matter to his constituents here before Parliament. While the petition and the concerns of the residents of Boxbeck, Chimistin, and the Greater Eguruleni Metro really matter, these electricity outrages are not a foreign concept to us. All residents who reside in the province of Gauteng and the country at large are held ransom by ESCOM crippled by corruption, and then further sabotaged by easy yoga, which is cable theft. Being without electricity has become a norm than an exception. I live in Soweto, Mpati Shalo, Lapoko, Nabantaba, Shabasoko, Lai, 
abroad, Tula Machubum Sebenzi, Abasokolayo, a Pilum Zabo, Nasin Dinabatala Guzo, Kota, Ba Gufanelega Gutiba Pata, and a footy in Ukes. We all are aware that the backlog of the petition committee is unending and that the complexities of the various challenges faced by our pe people across the country are difficult and not an easy fix. The IFP commends these residents for expressing their concerns through the existing platforms which are established for exactly the reasons we are declaring on the report in this house today. I bet that this route may be frustrating for residents to take as it, as, as it takes months. Sometimes, yes, in certain areas, we have failed by, by decades. The concerns of those who elected us here and those who speak for demand of us to do more. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, it is certainly something we need to address as the sixth parliament in trying to speed up the petitions, processes, and procedures so that our people can be heard in order to prevent the ongoing looting, violent, and destructive protests which flare up in all centers of our cities and communities in our country. These protests take place due to anger, frustration, build up over years. As residents face these backlogs in the delivery of services to their communities, Chairperson, therefore, the IFP support this report. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Fring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Um, Honorable Speaker, the outages experienced in Boxburg and Germiston in the city of Ekuruleni, as indicated in this report, is not an isolated case but symptomatic of a broader pervasive decline in service delivery due to a failure by municipalities across the country to invest in infrastructure upgrades and to implement the Municipal Finance Management Act and Supply Chain Management Act, amongst others. A look at the community of Marion Ridge in the city of Etiquini will reveal that barely a week goes by without electricity outages lasting hours at end. To add insult to injury, this community still has disease causing asbestos pipes delivering water to its residents. This is untenable, unacceptable, and a breach of the human rights of the residents of Marion Ridge. The same can be said of the neighboring community of Nagina, where continuous interruptions of electricity supply due to illegal connections are costing businesses in the area hundreds of thousands of rands not forgetting the health risk caused to the elderly, the infirm, the vulnerable, who depend on a continuous supply of electricity for their survival. The truth uh, of this house chair is that there, there are thousands of Marion Ridge, Nagina, Boxburg, and Germiston communities across the country with similar or worse conditions. This is corroborated by the Auditor General of South Africa's 2018-19 municipal report, which revealed that of the 257 municipalities, only 20 received clean audits, 72 are virtually bankrupt, 23 did not submit their financials by the 31st of August deadline, fruitless, wasteful, and unauthorized expenditure is at 14 billion, and irregular expenditure is at 32 billion. The ACDP believes that this is at the heart of all service delivery problems. Over the years, there has been much fanfare and talk at municipal level about back to basics and turnaround strategies. But if the report of the AG is anything to go by, this is all talk and no consequence management act action. The ACDP calls on the citizens of South Africa to take note of this and to vote accordingly at the next local government elections. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Sheikh Imam on the virtual platform. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Uh, the National Freedom Party supports the report tabled here today. Uh, what is got to put my lamp on? <laughs> uh, living in that particular area, 
Now we do acknowledge that ESCOM in particular have, have now made an announcement that they are going to look at the issue of security around particularly all uh, their substations and things, taking into consideration the amount of electricity theft that seems to be taking place, including the theft of cables and things. Now, the other problem that we seem to have, and it most municipalities chair, is the fact that we are not able to collect the revenue timelessly or collect revenue at all. And this is what is creating a serious problem for municipality to be able to function optimally because they cannot collect the revenue. And I know that there's been measures being put in There's been a lot of recommendation. It's a matter that needs to be dealt with. Uh, um, the other issue is, Chair, we see that there is a deadline that has been set, and it says that the report, my progress report, should be tabled immediately. And this meeting took place on the 3rd of June, so we're not sure whether this report has been tabled and whether it has now been sent through to the councillors and things to deal with it in the particular municipality. The other problem, of course, is the issue of... Um, aging infrastructure, but we must also be mindful that as the demand increases, as the uh, uh, economy uh, 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 grows and, and the, the number of people are growing, because remember our population is now about 59 million people. So what does it mean? We need to plan accordingly. And, and that is why the issue of making sure that we provide enough energy long term must be a priority that we need to. The National Freedom Party supports the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Chahisa on the virtual platform. Honorable Chahisa, are you there? If not, we will proceed to Al Jamar, the Honorable Hendricks. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can hear the Honorable Chaisa. Honorable Chaisa, are you there? No, he seems to be disconnected. Continue, Honorable Lenz. Not all day. Uh, Honorable Chair, uh, I have concluded. I'll just mass support the report. Thank you. I now recognize the Honorable Hadebe from the Chamber, the ANC. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Indeed, uh, Honorable Members of the DA and AFF are entitled to their own opinion, but certainly they're not entitled to their own facts. Since the dawn of democracy in 1994, under the leadership of the ANC, significant progress has been made with the establishment of structures of local government, expansion of access to quality basic service delivery for millions of South Africans. Honorable Chair, very few countries in the world have succeeded in expanding vital service delivery, such as water, sanitation, electricity, road, and housing for so many people in such a short space of time. Despite the significant gains over the past two decades, South Africans have continued to experience electricity challenges throughout the country. The people of Bosbeck and Germany are not alone. We are in this together as unplanned power outages in their countrywide challenges. We therefore cannot afford to politicize the plight of our people. Ours should be about doubling our efforts for the betterment of the poor. The poor should not at any time find themselves at the receiving end for poor service delivery. Honorable Chair, the ANC welcomes the report, which are the facts of the city of Kurulin, that money had already been spent to upgrade Germiston North substation, which was 90% complete at the time of the city of Kurulin appeared before us at the COGTA portfolio committee. This will play a critical role in stabilizing the power outages in the area. The municipality further stated that the area called Wardville had already uh, received electrical wiring and about 9,000 meters of old wiring will be replaced in the coming financial year, which begins tomorrow in June 2020. Having said that, Honorable Chair, the ANC remains committed 
to help small, medium, and micro enterprises, township economy, and all forms of entrepreneurship. This will propel the city to achieve far greater pace of economic growth. Honorable Chair, based on our interaction with the city of Okurulen, as led by the very progressive councillor Mzwandi Lemasina, and the above update and progress, it is clear that indeed the city of Okurulen, Yalkuba, <coughs> I'm not too sure what is Honorable Kachala's problem. Perhaps he's, perhaps he's allergic to the truth. <laughs> Honorable Chair, as I was saying, that based on the above uh, uh, progress and update and the interaction we had with the city of Ekuruleni, it is clear that indeed there is progress made by the city of Ekuruleni. Hence, I earlier on indicated that honorable members are entitled to their own opinion, but surely you are not entitled to your own opinion. I therefore move that we adopt uh, the report. Thank you, honorable chair. Thank you, honorable member. Honorable members, the motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections. The report is agreed to. The secretary will read the fourth order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs on petition from the residents of Alberton calling on the Assembly to investigate public participation and legislative compliance in the proposed housing development in Alberton, submitted by Mr. D. Bergman. I now call upon the Honourable Pumza from the Chamber who will introduce the report on behalf of the committee. The Honourable Pumza. Uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, the Portfolio Committee on Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs have considered a petition from Honorable J. Beckman of the DA calling on Parliament to investigate public participation and legislative compliance in the proposed housing development in the Alberton area. The Portfolio Committee having received this petition on the 21st of August 2019, convened a meeting with the city of uh, Tswane, uh, with the city of Gruden, uh, to consider matters raised. The committee, <laughs> the committee having an, a mandate on exercising oversight over the legislative and the local governments of government. And in response uh, to this request by Honorable Beckman, the committee sat with the city of Ekuruden on the 3rd of June 2020 and received a briefing from the municipality leadership. Honorable Beckman himself was invited to introduce the petition by reporting that all involved parties formed the part of the steering committee and they found the consensus and they resolved the matters amicably. And to the committee, this was a good ending story of which everyone could be proud of. The committee therefore has noted this and welcomed this good news. I therefore, Chairperson, submit this report on behalf of the committee for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Chief of the Majority Party. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I move that uh, this report be adopted by the House based on its content. Thank you. There's a request for declarations. I recognize the Honorable Bergman on the virtual platform. Chair, this was a pleasure to present in the committee um, what started out as the usual municipal story where developer gets being bonnet, somehow administration gets overly enthused about it, 
uses lovely buzzwords of EIA, public participation, you know, that leaves warm, fuzzy feelings to the mayoral committee that they've discharged their duty, regardless of the amount of tires that are burnt or the toy toying that is taking place in the streets below the air conditioned and flush leather offices. This time, the ward councillor rewrote the script. And when MMC Empire came to a full public meeting and received the petition of over 2,000 signatures against the mixed use development and began to bulldoze the development through in the normal, arrogant manner, the mayoral committee was soon to realize that they had misjudged the usual actors. As the community, both from the wealthy and the poor side, from the residential and business, had decided to work together. They had also decided to forget their parties that they belonged to and work with the councillor. And the councillor in turn brought the developer together with them and they formed a committee that was driven by the community. They decided that nothing was going to happen until the community had their say, especially when the original proposal had such a negative and destructive impact. This was a win-win situation where all stakeholders will now benefit and the environment will benefit, the amenities will improve and access to labor will increase. Therefore, it was a victory for the public and for the people that have only ever wanted to be treated with dignity and to be able to finally have their say and not always have, a, have people to have a say for them. When I got to present the petition to COGSA the other day, I was able to report that the petition falls away and I was proud that in my constituency, words like public participation, grassroots, environmental impacts uh, finally meant something to everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is from the EFF, the Honourable Sean Yana. Um, thank you, Chair. The fact of the matter, House Chairperson, is that the local government in South Africa has collapsed and our people are not included in anything that is happening. This is not only the case in which the residents of Ekuruleni, who was excluded in the proposed housing development in Alberton, but it is the reality faced by residents all over the country. Local government is supposed to be the sphere of government that is closed to our people, but corruption, incompetence, and weak governance have collapsed the sphere and our people are excluded from what is supposed to be their government. The main reason why the residents of Albertin was excluded is that already there are corrupt elements that have already allocated themselves tenders of the development and any democratic process that involves the people would inconvenience corruption. In future, residents should not have to write to parliament to demand their constitutional and rightful participation in democratic processes because the ruling party has forgotten that it was the people who elected them, this will continue to happen. Our people should realize that if they continue to elect people who do not care about their well-being, they will always matter when it's elections. Our people should be held accountable for the electoral choices they make because when they continue to vote for the same people who do not want to include them in the democratic processes because of corruption, they will have no one but themselves to blame in the future. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Gwezi on the virtual platform. Uh, Honourable Chairperson, unfortunately, is having some problems. So can I do the declaration on behalf of the IFP? Please proceed, Honourable Member. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Honourable Chairperson, the IFP welcomes this petition as stated by Honourable Bergman. And we acknowledge the importance of this constitutional mechanism for seeking and securing accountability from government and its officials across the country. The IFP wishes uh, to further encourage the swift and attentive processing of petitions, as my colleague Honourable Majosi said, as and when they are tabled before Parliament. The IFP notes the unacceptably long delays between submission of petitions and their resolution, leaving the concerned communities in dire circumstances for longer than they should be. The IFP wishes to emphasize the fundamental role played by public participation in the consideration and drafting of laws and policies, 
which affect our people in one way or another. And there are a number of landmark judgments which speak to public participation. While the IFP, like the Portfolio Committee, notes and welcomes the amicable consensus and resolution reached by the steering committee born from this petition, it would be remiss not to acknowledge the plethora of issues that plague the Department of Human Settlements at national, provincial, and local government levels, resulting in disgruntled citizens. Poor consultation is a regular complaint, as seems to have been part of the issue where this petition was concerned. The IFP wishes to encourage the department to get their foundations right so as to avoid delays caused by poor procedures, further delaying the work of the department and access to housing by beneficiaries. As is often the case, when government departments fail to effectively execute the mandate, the most vulnerable in our society suffer. According to a recent paper published by the Legal Resources Center on Jefferson in 2018, the housing backlog was 2.3 million homes, with some people having been on the waiting list for over 20 years. Others have seen their names disappear from the list altogether, forcing them to begin the process afresh. The LRC also noted that corruption plays an integral role in the unfulfillment of this right and the terrible backlog. The lack of transparency and accountability remain at the fore as to why many beneficiaries will never receive their homes. Officials facilitate this list jumping and the failure to implement plans suggest theft from the public purse. We acknowledge the tireless efforts of the Department of Human Settlements but, and we understand the problems they have to secure adequate, dignity-affirming housing for South Africans who need it. We recognize the collaboration with EMPD in the fight against illegal connections and fair access, but the IFP wishes to condemn corrupt practices which rob desperate and deserving beneficiaries of homes and demand more visible accountability in this regard. We also encourage the city to exercise caution and be more conscientious about public participation going forward. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Sheikh Imam on the virtual platform. Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The National Freedom Party supports the report tabled here today. But actually, Chair, this has a good ending in that all the different uh, authorities, the different role players, including politicians and officials, have all come together and found a solution. In the very first instance, that is exactly what we should be doing. We should be working together and being able to find solutions. Honorable Chair, in terms of the problem with the housing, we have a massive problem countrywide in terms of housing. There's a major problem with corruption in terms of the housing list. There are people that are waiting for 30 and 40 years. Here you get people coming in after two years and three years and jumping the queue. It's a matter that I think the minister needs to deal with. The other issue is, Chair, if you remember that repeatedly we discussed this in Parliament on trying to find a new model to provide housing in South Africa. And that was the one of finding, providing land, service sites that is with loans which is supposed to have come from the Human Settlement Development Bank. There is no clarity on to what is the latest development and I hope at some stage the minister can update us on, 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 on that. But uh, in a nutshell, Honorable Chairperson, the National Freedom Party welcomes the, 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 the measures that have been put particularly. And I think this augurs very well for other areas, municipalities throughout the country. I think it's a good example that if you come together, sit at the table, you'll be able to find solutions which will benefit ultimately. That's what we are there for. The National Freedom Party support. Us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Chaisa on the virtual platform. So, President, can you hear me, Chairperson? Yes, you are loud and clear, continuously. You can hear me, okay. I was just lost for some time. But I think now we should support this petition because it's talking about this housing development in Albertine. But what makes me happy is that the people have just formed the steering committee. And they are great now that this should be discussed. So we should support, we supported this one. And it was easy for them to come together and make a, a thorough decision and a good one. Thank you very much, Chair President. Thank you, Honorable Chais. Hendricks from Al Jamaa. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Al Jamaa supports uh, the report 
And uh, we feel that this is an indication uh, that the uh, people shall govern. And in this way, we honor the Freedom Charter. The uh, idea to establish a steering committee should be an example to all portfolio committees to give effect uh, to the provision in the Freedom Charter that the people shall govern and the issues shall be addressed. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hendricks. The next speaker is the Honorable Khadebe from the ANC, and he's in the chamber. Yes. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Based on South African perspective, uh, the National Policy Framework on Public Participation 2007 defines public participation as an accountable groups within selected committees can exchange views and influence decision making. It is also a democratic process of engaging people, deciding, planning, and playing an active part in the development and operation of services that affect their life. Having said that, Honorable Chair, it is not a secret that more than 25% of South Africans population live in the Gauteng province. It was estimated that uh, for the period of 2016-2021, Gauteng will receive a high migration rate, uh, which is slightly over 1 million. This will be apportioned to the economic inequalities between provinces in South Africa, and this will continue to contribute to the inflow of people to Gauteng provinces. This inflow will result in further pressure on the aging infrastructure and government services particularly housing provision. The ANC is pleased and acknowledges the, the work undertaken by the Gauteng uh, uh, government to continue to enhance and improve on the successes made over the past 25 years. However, as the ANC, we call upon uh, the strengthening of public participation to promote sustainability and decision-making by recognizing the community and the need for the community to interact in decisions that are affecting their life. The ANC understands that promoting public participation is not only important to promote a people-centered democrat, it is also critical because it strengthens the functioning of government. Subsequently, public participation will render a capable, accountable, and responsible state that will effectively assist the citizens of South Africa. Through the intervention of the portfolio committee, the ANC is delighted that the stakeholder had finally managed to come together and find one another. I therefore move that the House adopt the, the report. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Honourable Members, the motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The Secretary will read the fifth order. Consideration of report to Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs on petition relating to Glen Marais substation fire incident under City of Ikuruleni. I now recognize the Honorable Mpumza from the Chamber who will introduce the report on behalf of the committee. Honorable Mpumza. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, the Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs had received a petition from Honorable Michael Waters pertaining to the Glen, pertaining to the fire outbreak at Glen Murray substation situated within the boundaries of the city of Egorulani, which resulted in many residents not having electricity for six days. The portfolio committee, therefore, uh, on the 3rd of December, convened a meeting with the city of Glen, wherein the committee was briefed on the development on this matter. Mr. Mike, Mr. Wilson from the Energy Department had recounted the brief history of the substation to contextualize the event leading to the failure with emphasis on the fact it was approximately 50 years old. However, the incident that led to the equipment failure was the theft of the feeder cables. Mm -hmm. 
He indicated that there was sufficient maintenance work on the substation, including monthly inspections and follow-up job cuts, annual transformer oil sampling, annual infrared scanning, biannual intrusive maintenance, and weekly battery inspection and follow-up jobs. Following this incident, the city has executed repair works for the restoration of supply to customers, including replacing the damaged switchboard with a new switchboard. The city was able to restore electricity supply to all customers within seven days. In terms of the preventative measures, the city was installing groundbreaking pre-warning anti-theft devices in hot source areas on the top of the cabin, new switchboards, and undertaking the treatment of the feeder lines. The city also reported that there was visible progress in respect of the preventative measures outlined during the previous engagement, including the installation of early warning system, which has brought stability uh, to the fragility of the aging infrastructure. However, the city had no information on the progress regarding the criminal possession of officially implicated in the theft, as well as the cable between Van Ripit Park and Spartan, allegedly broken since 1 July 2018. The committee welcomed the presentations and even further was highly, although it was highly technical, there was an inquiry on whether the city, oh sorry, the committee also reached that a query on whether the city would prevent fire incidents that had undertaken that had undertaken time maintenance and on whether the use of mobile feeder port could have alleviated the power outage. At the same time, the committee took note of the city's report that there was sufficient maintenance work on the substation and that the mobile feeder port was unsuitable for substation the size of the gamma rays. It was more cost effective to maintain rather than repair infrastructure and it's cheaper to repurpose it than procuring new equipment. However, the committee had to be mindful that most of the electricity infrastructure around the Gruden was among the oldest in the country, some of it dating back to the Second World War. At the same, at the same as some of this infrastructure had exceeded its lifespan, there were limits to the veil of repairs and refurbishment. There was a need for the city to improve communication to residents as the electricity outage were concerned. The committee noted the report progress in this regard, including the creation of a WhatsApp group for affected residents. And the committee recommended that uh, the city must report on progress regarding criminal prosecution of the municipal officials uh, of the capital. The committee considered the report and therefore the committee is tabling this report before the house for consideration. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Honourable Member. I will now recognize the Honourable Chief of the Majority Party. Ngozi Slalo, Uweo Slalo. Dipakamisa indo yoba lenri yowi somteto. Mayamke lele nga ilo njongo kubai tuwe tanga. Gale njika langa, Ngozi. There's a request for declarations. I recognize the Honourable Waters on the virtual platform. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, just to let you know and the House know that five minutes ago, my electricity went off again this week. I'm sitting in darkness. I'm not making it up. You can't make this up. This is the reality of residents of Ikurleni. It is electricity crisis that needs urgent attention. Chair, in my previous um, declaration, I mentioned the fact that the city of Ikurleni accounts for nearly a quarter of the entire Gauteng economy, of which Kemp the Kempton Park area accounts for 26.4% of the city's economy, or 6% of the Gauteng economy. The residents and industries within the greater Kempton Park area have been subjected to prolonged and increasing power outages. This report pertains to a petition relating to a fire at a major substation called Glemere within Kempton Park. The lack of maintenance was the cause of the fire. As there were faulty breakers, faulty protection relays, and faulty battery banks, which were supposed to supply the protection relays with power. This prevented the breakers from opening when the fault occurred, thereby causing the explosion. For six days, residents sat in the dark in the middle of winter, smelling their food rot. Many people had no spare money 
to which to buy food and had to rely on, rely on the donations of others. To this day, the city of Ikuruleni has not compensated one single person for the loss of their food. The travesty of it all, Chair, is that residents did not have to be without power for a single day. If, and I say if, the Metro had fulfilled its basic functions such as repairing faulty cables. Documentation in the DA's position shows that faulty cables reported and logged as far back as January 2012 still have not been repaired. In fact, there is a total of 55 faulty cables not having been repaired within the Kempton Park area alone, many of which are high voltage cables. One such cable is that from the Spartan substation to the Van Riebeck Park substation, which should have been repaired nearly two years ago. This led to the Van Riebeck Park substation being unable to direct electricity to the Glen Maria feeder area. This chair is another example of an incapable state. To make matters worse, the situation at the Kempton Park electricity depot is so serious that cable faults can no longer be detected unless the cables have actually been stolen and where there is a physical hole in the ground. The general decay of the infrastructure has become so dire that electricians refuse to enter certain substations in Kempton Park due to them being unsafe. And when, re when repairs have to be done, whole areas have to be switched off instead of just specific areas. This causes unnecessary power disruptions to the residents and industries. Last year, June, I wrote to the National Energy Regulator, NERSTA, requesting they investigate the circumstances leading to the Glen Maria fire and to determine whether the city has transgressed any of its license obligations. I followed up my letter, there goes my, uh, my so-called battery, my backup light, but anyway, it doesn't matter, I hope you can still see me, I've got my cell phone here. I followed up my initial letter informing them of the dire situation at the Kempton Park Electricity Depot and the documentation, uh, doc documentation proving that 55 faulty cables have not been repaired. I've also requested I've also requested that they investi that their investigation be expanded to the entire metro and not just focus on the Kempton Park area due to the ever increasing crisis. Chair, my advice to the mayor of Ikuruleni and the ANC led coalition is to focus on basic service delivery such as electricity. Forget about your vanity projects such as the botanical garden, your vanity projects such as a zoo your vanity projects such as a Formula One racing track, and your vanity projects such as a Disneyland. The mayor may want to live in a Mickey Mouse metro based on goofy policies, but the rest of us don't. It is time the residents of Ikuleni took back more power. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. Order, Honourable Member. Can I just switch your mic on and make comments? The Honourable Ntweri, you out of order. The next speaker is from the EFF, the Honourable Kaiser. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this petition came to the attention of the Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs for the second time on the 3rd of June, following the appearance of the city of Yagoruleni on the 3rd of December 2019. And we have submitted our position in the, in the committee. Chief among challenges confronting the city is the fact that the issues pertaining to banning substations exist as a result of aging infrastructure and non-existence of maintenance. This is not a new phenomenon, Chair. It is common in many municipalities, such as Steve Chua General Municipality in Ward 14, in Gorsech, where a, sub a substation was recently banned due to similar circumstances. This is why the EFF has been calling for insourcing of government and state entities, which will result in insourcing of workers who will provide constant services to government and state companies. That the state will <laughs> and enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of governance institution to preempt all forms of corruption, abolish the usage of private com companies to fulfill functions and duties that government should fulfill. The city has failed to provide to the committee 
we, the, the city has failed to, to provide the committee with evidence pointing at how far is the investigation of two officials implicated, which demonstrated the lack of seriousness when dealing decisively with, with criminal activities within the municipality. To date, the committee is still waiting for the outcome of this investigation, coupled with the state of the cable connection in Van Ripik and Sparta, which demonstrated again Chair, how protected the, the, the processes of investigation and capacity to investigate whenever criminality raises its ugly head. We welcome the fact that the city has taken preventative measures to install pre-warning pre and anti-theft in, in hospitals devices in hotspot areas, which should bring about some stability. But we cannot accept the fact that electricity infrastructure has been left to exceed its, its lifespan. This is a sign of weakness in leadership. The city must pursue under underground cable power distribution in all areas that are prone to fire, to fire an explosion, thereby protecting the substation against overload, short circuit, air leakage, and surge in order to ensure sustainable provision of electricity to all residents. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Lutuli from the IFP, who is on the virtual platform. Honourable Lutuli. House Chairperson, it's the Honourable Fanamarva in the chamber. I will read his declaration, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Chairperson, the IFP notes and welcomes the Portfolio Committee's report on the Glen Murray substation fire and the impact thereof on residents serviced by the substation. And we thank the Honourable Waters for his intervention and we're sorry to hear that Ikareleni is again in the dark and indeed it is a crisis that warrants our urgent attention. Chairperson, the drafters of our constitution were very intentional when they included petitions as tools for citizens to seek redress. Therefore, the delays experienced between submission of these petitions and the resolution thereof is a real slap in the face of those who elected us. Chairperson, we can and must do better. The IFP acknowledges the depressing state of ESCOM on national level and recognizes the trickle-down effect of its inadequacies on local government. We are all aware of the dire state of infrastructure across our country. Regardless of these challenges, it remains the city's responsibility to repair and maintain infrastructure. In the case of the Glen Murray substation, the report indicated that two officials were implicated in the theft of those feeder cables. Why then, Chairperson, has the city failed to institute criminal proceedings against them? This failure feeds the kind of impunity that allows corruption to fester in public office, and it must be rooted out and dealt with decisively. Further, the IFP notes with concern the frequency of electrical faults and substation failures in the city of Ekurileni. It is unacceptable that South Africans who timelessly pay for their electricity supply must spend weeks on end without power and receive no communication from local government. Businesses who contribute to the economy and feed families are closing down. During these dire economic times, we can ill afford more people to be joining the mass unemployment lines. Chairperson, the arrival of winter and the national lockdown have seen a surge in illegal connections. Now more than ever before, there's a need for communities to practice responsible citizenship. Communities must report all criminal activity related to cable theft and illegal connections and assist police in identifying criminal elements in our communities. The IFP acknowledges the biggest societal issue behind criminal elements and plead with our communities to work together to root out this lawlessness. In the same vein, the IFP pleads with the city to assist in lending dignity to South Africans by monitoring and responding adequately to electrical problems and creating effective communication channels with its residents. I oh, thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next declaration comes from Honourable Sheikh Imam of the NFP. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The National Freedom Party supports the report table here today. Honorable Chairperson, uh, the petition that was provided by Honorable Mike Waters was very clear, and it all emanated from the Glen Murray substation that apparently burnt down. And in terms of what the, uh, the report from uh, Honorable uh, Mike Waters, it's very, very clear that there has been a 
problem in terms of maintenance, particularly in terms of the substation. And I think you could see that it's having some difficulty today as well. But uh, however, the Ekoleleni municipality has responded. And some of the responses are that the infrastructure is aging. It's over 50 years old. There's been theft of feeder cable. And they also alluded to the two Ekoleleni officials that have been implicated, particularly, I think, in the theft of this feeder cable. However, we not, uh, it is not clear at this stage, Honorable Chairperson, as to what is the latest development in terms of these officials. Now, we know, Honorable Chairperson, that previously, and not only when it came to ESCOM or, 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 or substations, but all government buildings, we've had a problem, particularly in terms of maintenance. We spent a lot of money in putting up new buildings, but we didn't set aside budgets for that. But I think we've dealt with that. And if, if the response we've got from ESCOM the other day and the minister himself telling us the measures that ESCOM is putting in place, if that's anything to go by, then I think we might be on the right track and might be able to prevent this in the future. Just on the issue of the uh, food waste, yes, Chair, maybe we need to look at a plan like we have on water. When water is wasted through leaks and things like that, there's an insurance covering it. Maybe municipalities need to look at something like that. The National Freedom Party supports the report and welcomes the recommendations that have been put in place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is Honourable Chaisa. Honourable Chaisa, if it's not available, I'll recognize the Honourable Khadebe from the ANC is in the chamber. Yeah, no, th thank you, Honor. 50 years old aging infrastructure. Here we are dealing with the legacy of apartheid. The aging infrastructure remain an issue in providing electricity to most parts of South Africa, and this impact on provision of quality of service delivery. However, the ANC is still committed in the renewal and the rebuilding of a capable developmental state for the acceleration of inclusive service delivery in local government. The functionality of municipality remains key in pursuing the national development plan aspiration of creating safe and economical stable spaces where citizens can live and work with minimum discomfort. Honorable Chair, on top of the aging infrastructure, South Africa is facing a major challenge, that of copper theft, which has negative impact on all citizens of the city of Kuruleni. The city of Kuruleni is not spared when it comes to the cable theft. There is an estimated loss of copper, which is approximately 5 billion per year in South Africa. Whereas giant strides have been made by local government towards extending service delivery to all people of South Africa. The task of sustaining both the quantity and the quality of services to those already with access remains a daunting one. The ANC welcomed the City of Kurulin report that there is a visible progress in respect of preventative measures to, uh, to outline, uh, which were outlined during the engagement that we had with the portfolio community, including the installation of early warning signs which has brought some stability to the municipality. The ANC remains committed to ensure alignment of planning for all the implementation of infrastructure projects by all the relevant role players across the three spheres of government. This will enhance efficiency in the infrastructure design and, develop and delivery, as well as improving the reliable uh, of the existing of the infrastructure. Honorable Chair, lest we forget that we are dealing with the legacy of apartheid, which was previously for the selected few. 50 years of old aging infrastructure, that cannot only be apportioned to the current uh, government. We need to face reality that previously electricity was a privilege to the selected few majority of our people did not have access to electricity. 
Now that we have taken the bull by its horn and have dispatched electricity to the majority of our people, we are bound to face with these difficulties, lest we forget. I therefore move that the House adopt this report. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The Secretary will read the sixth order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. On petition from the residents of Ward 37, Alberton North, Ukuduleni, calling on the Assembly to investigate the illegal occupation of Stand 1-1224, number 42, Second Avenue, Alberton North, submitted by Mr. D. Bergman. I now call upon the Honourable Mpumza from the Chamber, who will introduce the report on behalf of the committee. Uh, thank you, Honourable Chair and uh, Honourable Members. The Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Transitional Affairs, having received a petition dated 11 February 2020 from Mr. Willie Basson on behalf of the President of Ward 37 in Upperton North, convened a meeting with the city of Egonoreni to consider matters raised. And the political community having received this petition, which was calling on the National Assembly to investigate the illegal occupation of stand one stroke, one double two four, number 42, second avenue in Aberdeen, uh, set with the leadership of Egonoreni. Mr. Darren Bergman of the DA, the constituent head of Albertine, was also invited into the committee and he led the introduction of the petition, raising these matters. One that property owners and residents in Albertine North have been complaining since 2011 regarding the illegal occupation of garages and buildings belonging to the Department of Education. <laughs> that a court order was issued to evict the illegal occupants, but they are still there for several years. That the South African police have not taken action and the Agro Land Council has not provided alternative accommodation. And uh, that the officials of the city were avoiding visiting the area and that there were no chemical toilets in place. In response to this, the city of Rulene noted the input from Mr. Bergman, but indicated that the city was supplying chemical toilets extensively, including all its 119 informal settlements. That it would investigate the alleged issue of non-existent chemical supply in the buildings and garage in question. The executive mayor, uh, Mr. Mzwande Lemasina also committed to leading the city towards the resolution of the matter. The portfolio committee <coughs> uh, welcomed the executive mayor's undertaking to resolve the Ward 37 matter. But also the committee noted that the district development model should assist in facilitating the coordination needed to resolve the matter as it was revolved, as, as it involved diverse role players. As the owner of the stand in question and the key stakeholder in the matter, the Gauteng Department of Education should have been part of the meeting. For the committee to get a full story, it needed to hear from all the parties involved. And therefore the committee, having considered these matters, recommended that they should be, the committee should bring together all the stakeholders involved in what, 37 issue? including the Gauteng Department of Education within the three months of the adoption of this report. That from the city of ruling side, the executive mayor should initiate a process of uh, starting engagement with all involved parties and report to the committee two weeks after the date of the petition is hearing. And that the Gauteng Department of Human Settlement, Corporate Governance and Affairs must assist the executive mayor 
were required in executing this work. The committee chair submit this report to the House for consideration. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. I will now recognize the Honourable Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, this is in your report. Hello, I am Ibeiwe Thank you, Honourable Chief. I propose that the request for declarations. I recognize the Honourable Bergman of the Democratic Alliance. Honourable Bergman. Is the Honourable Bergman available? Yes. Please proceed. Chair, in Alberton lies a property, Liza's property next to a primary school. It's such a hot potato that between the Metro and the departments of education, it took a while till anyone actually claimed ownership to it. Um, you know, knowing what was going on there, I didn't know whether I would claim ownership of what was going on there either. However, leadership is required uh, to take responsibility here. Yeah? The residents have put up with this situation for far too long, as my honorable colleague has just said. Um, kids are approached at school for money. Um, they approach for my school for money. They dodge broken bottles. Honourable yes. Bergman, my apologies. There are two members who have their microphones on. The Honourable Mackenzie of the DA and the Honourable Sonti of the EFF. Honourable members, please switch off your microphones. Continue, Honourable Bergman. Thanks, Chef. Um, the kids are approached at school. Kids are approached at school for money. They dodge broken bottles on odd occasions, and they've had bricks thrown at them from residents. Um, um, and they split, you know, these residents are split into race groups and they formed into these different informal settlements on land that belongs to the Gauteng Department of Education. And clearly this land could be used more productively. So in my motivation to the committee, I stressed that there was a lack of immunity and the proximity. Chair, that's, uh, that looks like the chief work. Um, that could be used for um, that the amenities and the proximity to the schools formed a major hazard to illness uh, breakout such as cholera. And it wasn't a risk to the school kids only, it was a vice versa risk. This risk could also happen to people from the informal settlement as well, which could cause a problem on both sides um, because of the lack of ablution. And as the my honorable colleague had said, there was an argument and dispute as to whether there was a, um, a chemical toilets that were actually provided. And again, it is still disputed to today that these toilets are not, I've, I'm yet to see where these toilets are placed. Um, our concern lies that not just with the community of Alberton, but the informal community too. In a year that was themed anti-gender based violence, it is disheartening to know that underage children are sent to the traffic lights to be exploited by members of the community and beyond, picked up in luxury cars and brought back for a pittance. This cannot end well for anyone without any intervention. The property prices in the surrounding areas, the commercial opportunities continue to dwindle as the broken window policy is promoted in reverse in the Kuruleni. The sad thing is we know all too well that unless someone is killed or this petition makes it to the headlines, this petition will end up like a body with no life. It will go cold. So as my colleague again has said, we urge the chair of Cogta to please restore the faith of the community in the power of petitions and parliament by holding the municipality and the Gauteng Department of Education to account, by adopting our resolutions and our deadlines, and by flexing its muscle, by calling all these stakeholders to account within that allotted three months, and by showing this accountability. And I look forward to that follow-up. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. 
The next declaration is from the EFF, the Honorable Kalipi. Thank you very much, House Chair. House Chair, let us get something straight. We cannot criminalize our people for the poverty created by landlessness, who was brought by 1652 gang in South Africa. Secondly, Chairperson, majority of court cases and order granted to evict those who are called illegal occupants did not represent themselves at court case at court because only those with money are the ones who go to court. Our people do not choose to live in deserted buildings that are broken down. In South Africa, illegal occupation was done by colonial settlers who killed our forefathers and raped our grandmothers and stole, the, stole their land. This is why we want expropriation of land without compensation for equal redistribution. We want land for our people to build their homes, to build places of worship, sports, and live in decent accommodation they deserve. <clears throat> this is why, as the sixth parliament, we must finalize the process to amend section 25 of the constitution. But House Chair, as a sixth parliament, we must finalize the process to amend section 25 of the constitution. It's also important that we find a much more practical, meaningful way of resolving petitions, Chairperson. Part of the reasons why, as the EFF, we have always called for Parliament to move to Gauteng, which is more central, is that we will be able to engage with as many as people as possible, and not only those with the resources to submit petition, to fly to Cape Town, to make oral presentation, or through virtual platforms. Our people does not have that kind of resources. We want to remind the mayor of Eguruleni, Zwandi Lemasina, that no one must be evicted from anywhere during the lockdown and after the lockdown, especially if there is no alternative accommodation provided. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next declaration comes from the IFP. The IFP. Honorable Chairperson, uh, first of all, we want to thank Honorable Bergman for presenting this uh, petition. The illegal occupation, occupation of land in South Africa poses a major threat to government instability and investors in confidence in South Africa. Furthermore, it does not allow for the government to properly plan the use of land as it is faces increased pressure from populist group to release land. Honorable Chairperson, government like in this petition fund many of its building unused and dilapidated, which invite people to live in spaces that are not designed to accommodate them. Unused government building can be repurposed into living spaces for people instead of having to build and approve all new structures. All building can be brought up to space with renovations and turn into smaller apartments better than just sitting and decaying. Section 25 should start with government owned buildings like those give people some sort of, of, of place to stay. Honorable Chairperson, government owned property could be better controlled if repurposed for social housing and it would have directed access to motor and since the sales of consumption of drugs. If government would repurpose some of its buildings, we would see better social integration and correction into the metros. Being closer to metros can also reduce the strain on our public transportation system that needs to bring people from far places to work every day. Thus, the monthly income spend of travel for the majority of South Africa, South Africa can be reduced. Honorable Chairperson, the paper, the, to repurpose government building for those use of social housing need to be met with sufficient sanitary service service services. The provision of chemical toilet as seen in this petition is, is a small request in which we see government slow re response. For example, two years ago, President Ramaphosa promised to eradicate pit latrines in two years. We are now in 2020, two years have expired and we still have 
more than 300 still in operations. We agree that residents of Alberton North deserve safety in their community and all stakeholders must be consulted in achieving their safety. The Department of Culture and Education must come together to resolve in a way forward in housing the illegal occupations. The clear lack of corruption of cooperation between the level department have learned that the SAP useless in this situation. There is no way to house the illegal occupations. We call government to find them and to find our current existing provision in order to ensure responsiveness and cost saving. There's the IP do support that one because no one was cool man now in jail. Pune in the way you move in a eating park like Rulene, Pune in the way you move in a second extension ten. Open in the way 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 Abantu lapa kona batate kona umsaba munga kemtetu yende. Nge ngazo guti inze la zofela no kusele kaka unmeni akandula senya bonga sana. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next declaration is from the Honourable Swart in the Chamber. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, the ACDP wishes to thank the Honourable Bergman for raising this issue. As other speakers have indicated, property owners and residents in Alberton have been complaining since 2011. That's nine years about the illegal occupation of this property. Now, the executive mayor undertook to resolve the matter, and there are obviously issues relating to illegal drug sales, illegal accommodation, etc. And this was welcomed by the committee. However, the committee has decided to hear from all the parties in the matter. Now, maybe a similar consensus can be achieved as was early indicated in another Alberton matter. And we as the ACDP appreciate that all parties are going to be considered and heard, but we are concerned that on the face of it, there appears to be a valid eviction court order and that is not being implemented. Either you respect the rule of law or you don't. If the eviction order was improperly obtained, it can be set aside. And in addition, the Gauteng MEC for Human Settlements, Mr. Maila, recently said there's been a notable and concerning increase in illegal land invasions since the lockdown was announced. This mainly because no one could be evicted during the initial lockdown period. Illegal land invasions cannot be allowed. And what makes this case worse is that it goes back nine years. Now, it's important that if we are to abide by the rule of law, let us remember what the then Chief Justice-elect Pius Longa of the Constitutional Court said, whilst not ignoring the plight of the homeless, he said land invasions are a matter that threatens far more than private rights of a single property owner. Because of their capacity to be socially inflammatory, they have the potential to have serious implications for stability and public peace. Failure by the state to act in an appropriate manner in circumstances would mean that case Modiclip and others similarly placed could not look to the state and its organs to protect them from invasions of their property. That would be a recipe for anarchy. That is what the Constitutional Court has said. Either you respect court decisions and the Constitution or you don't. Now that matter was resolved and the court ordered an, an amicable resolution. But of great importance is the rule of law was upheld, the cornerstone of our constitutional democracy. And we trust that the same will be done in this matter. Court orders cannot and should not be ignored. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next declaration comes from the Honourable Sheikh Imam, who's on the virtual platform. Thank you, Honourable House Chair. Chairperson, I think you know we're missing a very important point here. And that is, what about these poorest of the poor people. And you know, earlier on today, we discussed and, and at great length the issue of Section 25 and amendments in providing land and housing to our people. If I understand this correctly, what are we looking for? Are we looking for our people to continue living like they've lived before 1994, where they had to live in the rural areas, Chairperson, and then travel once a year to visit their families, but go and live in hospitals? That's generally what we are trying to encourage and what we are looking for. Now, Honorable House Chair, 
The problem I have with this is that whilst I'm, I'm, I'm not condoning a, a land e e invasion, I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that our people need to be provided with housing. They want to also, these are human beings who want to live closest to where they work as well. And, and, and this is not really happening with whichever political party, wherever they are governing. It's easy to come out here and say evict the people. And yes, it's easy for the courts as well, Honorable Chairperson, to come out there and, 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 and give eviction orders. But where are these people supposed to go? Are we not supposed to provide alternative accommodation? Yes, it is an inconvenience to particularly the affluent communities. Is it not an inconvenience for these poorest of the poor people that have to live under those shocking conditions? Like we say, there's no toilet, even though the municipality is saying that they have actually provided 119 of these informal permits. Now, I think we need to be mindful of the plight of these people when we make these statements. You know, it's very easy and well and good to say evict the people and evict the people. These are human beings whose lives we are playing around with. And I think it's in all fairness, they are entitled to be able to occupy a decent home like everybody else. These are the people that were deprived. People are only moving into the urban areas, chairperson, is because they got no other alternative. They don't have any jobs. There's no development in the areas. They're moving to the urban areas. And when they move there, they have some expectation. If they're not going to go and occupy this land, one, I'm not saying it is right. Where are they going to live? How are they going to live? Where are they going to eat from? Who's going to give them a job? How are they going to travel? I think we need to consider all these things, Honorable Chairperson. The National Freedom Party welcomes this, this, this report. At the same time, we are saying, reason. let us no, be mindful the of the poor. Yeah, but you know what? Honorable members, may I once again request you to switch off and mute your microphones. You are causing a disturbance in the house. The next declaration will come from the Honorable Hadebe of the ANC. He's in the chamber. Honorable Hadebe. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The ANC-led government continues to build on the achievement made over the past 20 years to advance social transformation. It will continue to give priority to education and skills development. As South Africans work towards universal access in early childhood <laughs> development facilities, improving the primary education and enhancing efforts to strengthen higher education and vocational training. Whereas it is widely understood that the dispossession of land continues to undermine the prospect of millions of South Africans and it holds back the country's human settlement development. The African National Congress condemns the illegal occupation of property and or land grab, particularly when it threatens life of innocent learners. These learners should learn the principle of Ubuntu human values from the society they are living in, not this thing of land grab. Because the future of these kids and, and the future of uh, uh, these learners depends on the livelihood and the conditions where they live in. We cannot at any stage condemn the issue of land grab. We are not dealing with an apartheid regime. We are dealing with the legitimate elected government that enjoys the overwhelming support of the majority of the people within our country. So our efforts and action cannot be that of people that are dealing with the apartheid regime. Care and Comrade Grip, you see, when you come to these chambers wearing red overalls, gum boots, and magarab, and the only weapon in your hands is the hammer. You will see every problem as a nail. That's what's happening with those that advocate for the land grab. Now, Honorable Chair, at this current juncture, allow me on behalf of the Portfolio Committee to take this opportunity and express our sincere gratitude to one of our own, the, the executive mayor of the city of Ekuruleni, 
Councillor Mzwandi Lemasina and his entire executive for always willing and available to subject themselves to oversight and accountability as and when the portfolio committee demanded of them to do so. Honorable Whip, however, the opposite is true when it comes to the executive mayor of the city of Cape Town. He prefers distributing food parcel and in the, at the expense of oversight and accountability. Let me repeat, the opposite is true when it comes to the executive mayor of the city of Cape Town, when it comes to oversight and accountability. More than three times the portfolio committee of cooperative governance and traditional affairs, the cooperative word being cooperative, have called on the city of Cape Town here. The executive of the executive mayor of the city of Cape Town was missing in action on three occasions. Hence, I'm saying without any fear of contradiction that we want to take this opportunity and congratulate the executive mayor of the city of Ukurulin for his willingness and resolve to put service delivery above everything else. I'm living in Kutu, Chair, I, no service delivery. I understand that could be two issues. there could be two issues that are engulfing the city of Cape Town. One, maybe the center does not hold. Two, maybe the mayor is a ceremonial mayor and the real mayor is Alderman Ian Nelson. Now, he is control, you know, the puppet and the puppet string. You have someone there on top pulling the string and the mayor being the puppet dancing for the music. <laughs> Honorable, I told you, Nimote Dizil Bashushukate. In conclusion, uh, Honorable Rip, the executive mayor has demonstrated his commitment and he is prepared to take the bull by its horn in defense of the national democratic revolution to the advancement of the national democratic society. I therefore move that the house adopt the report. I thank you. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? There are no objections and the report is thus agreed to. I will now hand over to the Honorable Deputy Speaker to continue the presiding of the session. The Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, House Chair. Uh, Honorable Members, we now call the Secretary to read the seventh order. Petition pertaining to service delivery in now, now, the Mile Pius X, X22 under City of Twane. I now call upon the Honorable Gigi Mpumza, who is in the chamber. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker and uh, Honorable Members. We may be. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, the Portfolio Committee on Traditional Af on Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs had received a petition from the residents of Nail Mapias Extension 22, calling on the Gauteng MEC for Cooperative Governance, Human Settlement, Traditional Affairs to attend to their service delivery grievances against the city of Tswane. The Portfolio Committee, therefore, being its mandate to oversight the executive and local sphere, invited the leadership of Tswane to a city of the committee on the 4th of June 2020 uh, to consider matters raised in the petition. 
Ms. McIntyre, a member of the committee and the residents of the city of Swane, introduced the petition as follows. That the people of Nilmapias extension 22 felt neglected by the government. So they had no access to electricity and network connection. A contractor named Reliant Electricity had actually dashed their hopes of access to electricity when it packed up its electricity installation equipment and left the area due to not receiving payment from the government of Swan. The additional grievance of the community of Nelmapias included the distribution of food parcels to well-connected people and living the poor and the destitute, insufficient provisioning of transportation and the need for mobile police station to patrol extension 22, as well as building of a school. It's indicated that Nilmapias had a high percentage of disabled people and the people's grievances had been going on for years without a response from that government. The city of Tswane a serious problem that concerned every boat in Tswane and said the area back was the theft of electricity cables for the purposes of recycling the copper. This continued to be a challenge the municipality could not reach all areas and left the early warning technology. The recently appointed administrators of Swane under the leadership of the able Mponawa visited the area earlier in the day and spent the better part of it speaking to the community about the matters of concern. This was part of their responsibility to restore order and stability in the area and attend to electricity crisis. The committee made observation and welcomed the report from the interim and administrative team of the city of Tswane and applauded the team's efforts toward the resolution of the problem affecting municipal residents. Although the team answered all questions, the answers were not always satisfactory. A mobile police unit would assist greatly in increasing police mobility and detail crime in extension 22. The committee noted the city's appointment of 169 additional metro police under the leadership of NAWA to strengthen the capacity to enforce the law. There was a danger that the inequitable distribution of services in the seven, where some of section were receiving services while others were not, and could also sow division that could further destabilize the community. There was no sufficient indication to show that the team was, no, no. There was sufficient indication that the team of administrators would give attention to this issue. Hey, Mamelani. Mamelani. And uh, they were simply, the committee noted the submission and absentia by the Department of Human Settlement that many of the challenges experienced related to the introduction of lockdown, and now that it is posed permissible for contractor to resume work, these issues will receive the necessary attention. And in this regard, the committee emphasized the need for members, particularly those of Swane in the leadership, because there was absence of strategic leadership before, to make sure that the contractors are back at work and are on site in Nail My Players. The committee had recommended that the team of administrators under the eight leadership of Mponawa must immediately put time frames on the activities pursued to resolve the problem in Nail Mapias Extension 22, including the 700 houses due for electrification that we have not done. Thank you, Honorable. As well as the development of a crime prevention plan to address the problem of the the city of Tswane should urgently follow up with the Department of Human Settlement regarding the matter of revenue. Chair, we are there for support consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize the Honorable Chief Whip of the Majority Party from the Chamber. 
Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, in the House, I move that this report be adopted. Thank you. Is there any objection to the report being adopted? None. The report is therefore adopted. But uh, wait, wait, let's do this. At the request, the declaration vote has been received. Uh, Honorable Brink from the chamber of the DA. Thanks very much, Deputy Speaker. It's good that we're meeting in Cape Town and not Kempton Park this evening, because at least the city of, of Cape Town can keep the lights on, uh, unlike the city of Ekuruleni. But uh, to this petition, uh, Deputy Speaker, large parts of Nalmapius have been developed in the last 25 years, but in extension 22, there are houses built by government that still do not have an electricity connection. It would seem that the Gauteng provincial government failed to pay a contractor who then walked off the site. But this is not the full story. The portfolio committee could not establish a clear account of what happened to the housing project in extension 22 Nelmapius because the Gauteng provincial government was a no-show at our meeting. It was left to the administrators of the city of Tswane to comment on the matter as they could and to promise to spur the provincial government along. But as we know, once a municipality gives over to the province land and bulk infrastructure for a housing project, the power and the responsibility shifts to the province. It is the province that appoints the contractors, builds the structures, secures the sites, connects the water, and then hands over the keys to the families. The Gauteng Housing Department did send the Portfolio Committee a memo in which it claimed that some of these houses in Almapius were illegally occupied in May 2019. But in the absence of Gauteng's MEC for housing, uh, Lebohang Maile, and his head of department, we could not ask the most important questions. Why was the housing project not secured? What attempts were made before the lockdown to evict illegal occupants? And are some of the illegal occupants in fact now petitioning parliament to have those housing units electrified? Maybe these questions were too embarrassing for MEC Maile to answer. Gauteng has a housing backlog of over 1 million, but can only build 250,000 houses in any given one year. But, but in the past two years, that Department of Housing in Gauteng has forfeited more than 1.5 billion rand in funds from national government because they could not spend on budget in time. So while the DA supports this report, we are minded to ask colleagues in the Gauteng Provincial Legislature to find out from MEC Maile what is going on in his department, especially with contracts awarded to people who can't do the job, who overcharge, and due to planning failures lead to endless disputes. And it's not just Nalmapius, it's the Alexandra Renewal Project, it's the many hostels in Gauteng that are in a dilapidated state, and it is this department that is to blame. But, Deputy Speaker, we know that South Africa's housing code is defective in many ways. And our model of providing public housing in South Africa is not sustainable. But Gauteng's housing department seems to be making the worst of a bad situation. It is only if provincial housing departments like the one in Gauteng gets its own house in order that it will be able to negotiate significant reforms to the housing code and a realistic and affordable model for public housing in South Africa. In the meantime, it must take the full blame for the failure of housing projects like the one in extension 22. In conclusion, Deputy Speaker, as the AG said last week in a different context, in every society, some people do not want to work. Unfortunately, they have the upper hand in a society that lacks good leadership. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. The reality is that there is no municipality in Zwani. 
things have completely collapsed because of the DA incompetence and corruption. Issues of poor service delivery do not only affect Nemal Piers, but the whole of Tuane. People of Mamelodi, Atejville, Soshangove, Moiplas, and Oliven are all forgotten and do not receive any services from the municipality as we speak. It takes more time than it should to fix even the most basic electricity blackout. What is even more shocking, Deputy Speaker, is that a clear indication on how things have collapsed is that even in the white and affluent areas, the municipality does not even collect rubbish. Electricity failure are more frequent and traffic lights on the main intersections are never fixed. This is why the residents of Nemal Pierce and residents of Tuane should give the EFF an opportunity to govern the, cap the capital city. We will insource security guards and cleaners. We will clean all the mess in the townships. We will deliver clean and drinkable water to the people of Hamaskran. We will put a pedestrian bridge for the people of Oliven. We will put electricity for the people of Mnandi and Moiplas. The municipal buses will go to Soshanguve, Mamelodi, Atejville, and all other townships to service our people. We'll turn all deserted buildings into the health facilities and we'll build the community health facilities in each and every ward to prioritize primary health care. People of Tuane must remind both ANC and DA when by elections take place that they have suffered a lot under the, their governance. People of Tuane must stand up and say enough is enough. Only the EFF will take us to the promised land. Therefore, I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Job, Honorable Stoll, uh, for the IFP. Honorable Deputy Speaker, may I crave your indulgence? Honorable Machos, Honorable Machos, you will be doing this. Thank you very much on the virtual platform. Oh, thank you very much. Go ahead, Honorable Member. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. This petition dealt with numerous service delivery problems, which are common throughout the nation. Government needs to speedily address basic service delivery issues like electricity, mobile uh, service station, public transport, and schools. Many of the problems faced, such as theft of electricity cable, could be avoided if there were better visible policing in hotspots. The call by the petition to have a mobile police unit must be applied to many other vulnerable communities, as its approach can deter criminals from stealing electricity cables. The additional policing must find capacity in monitoring and disconnecting illegal connections to the power grid. Illegal connections jeopardize all users of electricity and cause huge damage to property, especially food that spoils as a result of fridges being off. The lack of service delivery regarding electricity and policing directly affects government currently failing approach to, to reduce crime in South Africa. Studies show that improving street lighting reduces crime by nearly 30%. That means we can potentially see uh, 6,300 less murders and 15,600 less cases of sexual offenses just through adequate street lighting and service delivery. Over the past six years, violent service delivery protests cost the country 392 million rand in damages. The figure alone could have gone to building schools, hospitals, police stations, small delivery, uh, small businesses who suffer when there are service delivery protests. The list can go on. We call on government to step up its approach to service all communities with legal access points to electricity. Currently in South Africa, it is difficult to distinguish between those who connect illegally due to desperation and those who do it out of pure criminality. The IFP encourages people in all communities across the country, especially in Tuani, that uh, where there is IFP, there is stability, and they must be vigilant and report cable theft and illegal connection as it places their very own access to electricity at risk. I thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam.
Thank you, Honorable Chair. Deputy Speaker, the National Freedom Party supports the report tabled here. Now, Deputy Speaker, there has been several complaints, and this appears to be going on for about five years. And the, the complaints are basically about service delivery. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves, why should a community be complaining about service delivery when there is public representatives that are paid to look after the interests of these people? And I'll tell you one of the reasons, Deputy Speaker. And I, and, and I think the minister is, is present as well. And I hope the minister will take cognizance of and do something about it. One of the problems is that public representatives, are, they report to their political parties. They don't really report to the structures that, that and, and, and are not accountable to these structures. And that goes for all three spheres of government. And that is why you would feel, find there's a gap between the community and public representatives. Now, there's no reason why community should be complaining again and again and again, and very little or nothing has happened. Now, let me say to the Deputy Speaker that if you've got poor service delivery, it will lead to socioeconomic challenges. That in turn will lead to high crime rate. We've earlier spoke about gender-based violence and things like that. It is because the public rep representatives are not seen. The only time they get seen is when it's a couple of months just before the election. So I think we need to put in more measures to ensure there's greater accountability and that the public representative at all times must be in touch with the people on the ground. Now, there's a very good thing that the new the Minister of Finance is now introducing, and that is zero-based budgeting. That means you will talk to the needs of the people on the community and budget accordingly. What has been happening before is that they come up with a budget with no plan. When you give them the money, they can't spend the money. So indeed, if the zero-based budgeting is introduced, I think it will go a long way, Deputy Speaker, ensuring that there is better services provided to our people on the ground. But the National Freedom Party supports the, 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 the report that is tabled here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Honorable Njaisa. He's in the chamber there. I, I believe he has disconnected, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Okay, let's move on to Honorable Hadebe from the AG. No, hectic, hectic day. Um, thank you, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, Comrade Whip, uh, to the DA and Freedom Front Plus, as we close the youth month, Franz Fanon once taught us that each generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. Our mission is very clear and unequivocal, land expropriation without compensation. And that will be achieved in this current administration. We are not shaken. We are not threatened. Siakuba, siakuka. Catch us if you can. <laughs> Honorable Chair, today we have dealt with five petitions as received by the Speaker's office, and correctly so. They were forwarded to us as the Portfolio Committee of COCTA to process. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we are a nation united in diversity. In our 2019 election manifesto, which was a people's plan for a better life for all, we committed ourselves that we, do, we will work to unite all South Africans to overcome the divisions of the past and build a country in which all belong and in which all free, feel free to call it home. Therefore, it was not a coincidence that when communities across the length and breadth of our country approach parliament for assistance with their petitions on issues that are affecting their livelihood, 
as the portfolio committee, we expeditiously attended to all their issues. Hence, we are here today. We have summoned all three spheres of government with their accounting authorities to appear before us in an attempt to find an amicable solution to their challenges. And to that end, we have done successful. The ANC-led government remain committed in building a peaceful, safe communities. The ANC rely heavily on the South African police services to prevent, combat, and investigate crime, maintain public order, protect and secure the citizens of the Republic and their property. To this end, we uphold and enforce the law as enshrined in the Constitution. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the residents of Nimal Palace, Extension 22, and all stakeholders involved should at all material times strive to arrive at the solution on matters concerning security and constitutional imperatives. <laughs> Let me come okay. to Omega, Honorable Mr. Speaker. You see, the challenges of Swane must be apportioned to EFF and DA. <laughs> DA Chair, Chair, on a serious note, point of order. This is too much. Honorable that Honorable Primrose. Okay, sure. Honorable Deputy Speaker, there is a point of order in the house. I don't care. Please take it, man. No. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, ever since we started at two o'clock, this honorable Primrose has been causing disorder in the house. Can she be muted right now? I think the Honorable Primrose is Honorable Sonti. Honorable Sonti, please. Siazu which is cut so peg, a marungas jail, chinasi same seven z. Stogoze. Thank you. Continue. Please conclude, Honorable Member. No, I'm saying the challenges of Tswane are as a result of EFF and DA and Bonnie Alliance. Because DA is having this uncontrollable desire for power. And EFF, you see, if you, if you don't stand for something, you are bound to fall for anything. Hence, you have fallen with the wrong democratic alliance. It's your bed, you've made it, lie on it. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, yeah, honorable, yeah, uh, 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 honorable member, uh, Khalid, you can't speak like that to any member of parliament. Please, man, just hold it. Uh, yeah, the motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? Uh, honorable member, you are really out of order, and it's not correct. Don't insist. There's no objection. We move to... The secretary will read the the report is therefore agreed to, and we now move, the secretary will read the last order of the day. Petition from residents of Dry Hearts Village calling on the assembly to investigate the reopening of the Malo Malo Middle School submitted by Mr. I S Tolo. Uh, I now call upon the Honorable BP Mbingo Gigaba to speak to us. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. On the 26th of February 2020, the National Assembly MP, Honorable I.S.C. Cholo, tabled the petition from the residents of Dry Heights Village, calling on the Assembly to investigate the reopening of Molehabangwe Middle School as a primary school in 2021. It is with great humility for the National Assembly today to declare that Molehabangwe Middle School will now be converted to a primary school after the Department of Basic Education, both national and Northwest province concurred with the petition and 
recommended to convert the now defunct school to a new primary school for the rural and farming communities along the Freiburg Road. The Molehabangwe Middle School opened in 1981 and is a good example of a public-private partnership with, which worked well. A private company donated bricks to the chief of that area in the spirit of Ubuntu and taking care of the future leaders of tomorrow, to the youth of South Africa. The school thrived for years before the Committee on Rural Education undertook its rationalization project, decided in 2016 to merge Molhabangwe, Sibuta Mahuro, and Buijane School to a single secondary school. The committee deemed it fit to support the petition of Dryad's village because the investigations revealed that young primary school kids were walking at least four kilometers to get to the nearest primary school in a dangerous environment. It is only pr prudent that as we close the youth month, critical decisions be taken in favor of tomorrow's leaders. Mulehabangwe consists of five classroom, classroom blocks, an entire admin block and functional toilets, which will need to be converted to suit grade R to grade seven. A new kitchen will need to be constructed as well. We sincerely hope that this infrastructure will quickly up be upgraded so that the school can meet the reopening deadline of January 2021 for teaching and learning. This is in line with providing youth access to education. As Portfolio Committee, we sincerely hope that in the spirit of quality access to basic education, the people of Dryads, Village and surrounding communities will volunteer their time and human resources to help the speedy renovation at this school and not only stop with the petition. We move that the House consider and adopt the report. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, Chief Whip, uh, what do you reckon we do? We missed you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I move that uh, the House adopt this report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are requests for declarations. I will now call on Honorable uh, C. Kulo. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, and uh, a good evening to the Honorable Members in the House and uh, on virtual. Honorable Deputy Speaker, on the 11th of February uh, this year, the Portfolio Committee on Basic Education met to discuss and engage on the petition as already indicated by the Honorable Member. Moela Abangwe Middle School, as rightly indicated, was rationalized, or was earmarked for rationalization uh, in December of 2015. Following the oversight by the Democratic Alliance in the Greater Taung Local Municipality, on the 30th of August in 2019, we found the following as it related to the school and in respect of the area in dry hearts. The nearest primary school as indicated by the honorable member is indeed 3.6 kilometers uh, to the nearest primary school. Uh, this is due to the expanding community in that particular village. This means that honorable deputy speaker uh, that uh, School, le, primary school learners uh, have to walk 3.6 kilometers a single trip to get to their nearest school. This is despite the fact that there has been a school that is uh, available uh, within their vicinity. We found that the nearest primary school was overcrowded, which hampered the quality of teaching and learning due to the disobedience by some learners. The teachers at the nearest school, which is Molemoweng Primary School, complained and indicated that, that they are unable to give the necessary and required attention to their learners due to issues of overcrowded classrooms. We found that the majority of the parents were unemployed as a result. They could not afford the 150 rand a fee that they had to pay per month for the children to get to school. Often the buckies that were ferrying this, uh, this primary school children were alleged to be unroadworthy and thus posed a danger to, uh, to the children. The parents further in, informed us that they are afraid of the safety of their children, more so during winter as it's somewhat fairly dark in the early hours of the morning, so the safety of their children was not guaranteed. 
as it pertains to the infrastructure at the school, Honorable Deputy Speaker, and this was also confirmed by the report as submitted by the, uh, the Provincial uh, Department of uh, Education in the Northwest. The infrastructure condition of the school in Mulehabang when dry huts was still intact and required only minor renovations. There were five classrooms that could be utilized, but will also require renovations. There were newly built ablution facilities, but this will require that they be converted to suit primary school aged children. There is electricity and water in the premises. There has been electricity and water in the premises, unlike in many other schools around the province of Northwest and, and around the country. Furthermore, the population growth also supports the reopening of Molehabang as a primary school. Honorable Deputy Speaker, it is given the described condition of the school that the parents were afraid that the school will be broken into, used as a haven of criminal activities. There had already at the time of our oversight been attempts by some community members to erect housing uh, structures within the premises of the school. It is therefore, Honorable Deputy Speaker, with the above provided details, that the DA took the proactive uh, step in getting the matter of Mulehaba Middle School debated by the National Assembly and more specifically the Department of Basic Education. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we further welcome the decision by the Provincial Department of Education in the Northwest as per their report as submitted to the Portfolio Committee of Basic Education that the 2020 financial year will be set aside to attend to all related matters as it relates to the reopening of the primary school. And these amongst others will include the re-registration of the new primary school, the renovations of existing building and procurement uh, and relocation of mobile classes if necessary, the identification of learners to be relocated from the neighboring schools to Mulehabang Primary School, the registration of new learners, the provision of uh, uh, human resources, as well as the procurement of the, of the learner and teacher support material. In concluding, Honorable Speaker, I would like the house to note that Molabang is not the only middle school that remains closed despite having the required infrastructure. We ask thus that the, the, the Department of uh, Education in the Northwest uh, province visit schools such as Boaring Middle School and Ratambai Middle School and consider opening said schools as they have agreed to do so with Molabang. The Democratic Alliance, Honorable Deputy Speaker, will be at Mulehaba uh, Primary School on the first day of the 2021 academic year to help welcome the children to their new school. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Mashabela. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. We support the report concerning the petition from residents of Dry Head Village calling for the reopening of the Mulehaba Middle Schools. Deputy Speaker, this is one of many examples of schools, especially in the Eastern Cape and main farm areas where schools are closed without consulting parents or with a proper plan on how to provide education. The department has closed a school and failed to provide transport for learners. Deputy Speaker, majority of parents who are farm workers cannot afford transport. And as a result, their kids are now sitting at home. School learners have to walk long distances. And in these days where children are murdered and raped every day, how do you expect these learners to walk? The reopening of the school and many other schools that were closed without a proper plan should be reopened. Many of the school buildings that are closed are now harboring criminals used for criminals activities and it is a wasted infrastructure. The school should be reopened and should also create jobs. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Ngobo of the IFP. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker and Honorable Members. At the core of this petition lies the matter of overcrowding of primary schools serving uh, the this, this small community of Dry Hearts Village, just outside Freiburg. As it is clear from the reports presented to the Portfolio Committee on 11 February 2020 by the Northwest Department of Education and the National Department, of basic education, 
to the portfolio committee. The reopening of the Mali Habangwe Middle School as a primary school is supported. We understand the investigation by the Provincial Education Department showed an additional primary school would be viable, considering a new settlement is growing towards Freiburg growth. The school building was also considered to still be fit for human occupation. And according to uh, the report, after the minor renovations could be reused as a school. The principle here is of the services going to the people, then the people following the services, whatever they are. And the Inkata Freedom Party believes very strongly that instead of uh, shutting down schools, uh, it would be better to build new schools where they are needed or refurbish schools uh, rather than passing learners uh, to faraway schools. Let the children wake up from their communities and be accommodated in the nearby schools. The Provincial Education Department's report stated that the school would be re-registered and operational for the uh, 2021 academic year after all renovations had been attended to in 2020. The financial implications of these renovations, according to the Provincial Education Department's report, would be about 2.5 million rand for infrastructure, 320,000 rand for learning and teaching support materials, and 150,000 rand for school furniture. Uh, furthermore, as the presentation to the portfolio committee was made before the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic, the IFP believes it is prudent to be provided with information on the impact of reprioritization of funds on this project and practical commitments made prior to this pandemic. Honorable members, in conclusion, we need to remind ourselves what is at risk. Now, more than ever before, we have to actively assist in removing obstacles to access to education. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Sheikh Imam. Sorry, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the National Freedom Party supports the report tabled here today. Uh, Deputy Speaker, what is uh, what we do establish is this, that yes, indeed, the committee, the portfolio committee, has dealt with this matter. The report from the provincial, Northwest Provincial Department of Education is very clear that they have addressed the issues of budgetary uh, 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 challenges that they may face, and they are quite um, optimistic that they will be able to deliver and ensure that the 2020 uh, year, academic year that they will be ready indeed. Uh, in terms of the report, it is very clear that this particular community is a very vulnerable community and that uh, having traveled over 3.6 kilometers, particularly for these learners, uh, created a whole lot of challenges uh, over and above the risk and, 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 and the issue of crime and uh, the long distance that these poor learners had to walk. I think uh, the decision that has been taken by the provincial department and the national department must be welcomed. And I think the dry arts uh, community uh, 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 will be celebrating today that indeed, after all their struggle, in, you know, when the schools were actually closed. And I think that's one of the things we need to address, Deputy Speaker. This policy of closing schools and the inconvenience and the impact it has on learners, particularly those from the primary schools. So I think it's something that we really need to relook at. We welcome the decision that has been taken, and we look forward to ensuring that the provincial department ensures that in the first week of the 2020 academic year, they are able to fulfill their obligations in terms of ensuring that all processes are complete by then. Thank you very much. The National Freedom Party supports this report. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Njaisa, has he connected? If he hasn't, we will move to Honorable Adduns uh, from the ANC in, uh, on virtual now. Uh, on behalf of Honorable Adduns, it's Murad Setha. 
Oh, okay. Go ahead and that. Roma Mezi. Thank you very much, Honorable. I mean, Deputy Speaker. Um, we are listening to you. Fellow Honorable Members, as the ANC. Oh, the Honorable Deputy Speaker. Yes, uh, sorry to, to interrupt you, Honorable. Uh, I think the Honorable Isa is there. He has connected. Can you try to get him back before Honorable Murwazeka? Okay, if he has connected, please let him speak. Okay. Honorable Murwazeka will understand. Honorable Isa? Yes, Isa. I saw your name. Yes, you are there. Please speak. We can. Can you can you Honorable hear me? Yeah. Don't ask whether we can hear you. We can. Okay. Thank you very much. I know it's because <laughs> we are off in that way. I come from wilderness. I'm back from wilderness. Deputy Speaker, I think we should appreciate that the efforts that have been taken by the people of Fly Hearts Village. You know that community it means that they are very much in favor of school. I think that we support the idea that the school should be reopened. It was just because of this rationalization that the school has to be opened. Though the school now will look up with the same, but it will be a primary school. But now at least now they will be having school because it was a risk for the young ones not to go to a far away school. So we do support the idea. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just wanted to express that. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, Honorable Adwans, he has opened the space for you to speak now. Please go ahead. So, yes. Honorable Murad Shraman. Hey, yeah, sorry. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker, fellow Honorable Members. As the ANC, we commend the active role by the community of Dry Hearts in ensuring access to education for their community. The school was closed due to the rationalization of schools in 2012. Small schools and non-viable schools were affected by the rationalization policy in the interest of efficient use of resources for better learning and teaching. This policy does away with circumstances of multi-grade teaching that affects many small schools in rural areas or in farm schools. People migrate to different locations based on various socioeconomic circumstances. The increase in population due to new settlements in dry huts has created viable conditions for the school to reopen. The population of dry huts or of any area changes year in and year out as people migrate. The ability of government to re-evaluate decisions with changes in the population are important. The decision to reopen the school by the Northwest Department of Education should be acknowledged and be appreciated. The rationalization decision to close Molehabangwe, coupled with an increase in the population in the area, has led to the overcrowding in Molemuyeng Primary, which has 316 learners coming from the area where Molehabangwe is located. Overcrowding is one of the factors that affect teaching and learning. The fact that other schools were understaffed and experiencing overcrowding, the reopening of Muliabangwe Primary School will ensure that the schools in the area have the appropriate learner to teacher ratio. The Northwest Department of Education submitted a detailed breakdown of the costs and a detailed breakdown of management plan for Muliabangwe Primary to the Portfolio Committee on Basic Education. The Northwest Department of Education has developed an effective plan to reopen the school and ensure it has all the required basic services infrastructure for conducive learning and teaching. 
And as the ANC, we believe that the development of our society will be anchored by quality basic education. The ANC has developed policies that ensure our children have access to education to create a better future for them and as a nation. The NDP, National Development Plan, requires that interests of all stakeholders to be aligned to support the common goal of achieving good educational outcomes that are responsive to the community needs and economic development. This decision will also give access to the grade R and ECD, learning at a convenient location within the community of dry huts. Cumbersome circumstances for children in accessing schooling, like distance schooling, demotivate learners increasingly, and they also subject them to the risk of dropping, dropping out. The department should continue to keep in touch with our communities. A strengthened communication with our communities will always ensure the interest of the people is always in the center of our decisions. The reopening of the school will further protect the legacy of the chief who envisaged its establishment through infrastructure donations in 1981. We also commend the role of the chief in writing to the department for the reopening of the school. His intervention demonstrates the role of traditional leadership in developing their communities. The reopening of the school will increase the safety of learners who had to work at any such neighboring schools. The safety of learners should always be prioritized as it affects their ability to learn effectively without distraction. The reopening will alleviate the transport costs that communities had to spend in ensuring learners get to the school. And most of all, the children that walk long distances daily to schools. The reopening will also make use of existing school infrastru infrastructure, which was becoming a breeding ground for criminality and vandalism. The rapidly growing population in the new settlement in Dry Hearts will be served by the new primary school reopening in 2021. Education is one of the tools to alleviate poverty and inequality. Spatial development is an important aspect of creating a better life for all the people of South Africa. The location of schools should always offer convenient and be accessible in remote areas. The reopening will also address the access inequality of rural and urban schools. Through education, we will provide an opportunity for all South Africans to participate in the economy of the country. As I conclude, Honorable Deputy Speaker, as the African National Congress, we want to rise and support the report because it represents the yearning of the people of Dry Hearts for a better life and the community. This decision we support and reflect the commitment of the government to ensure equal access to equal education for all. And I thank you. Uh, thank you, Rex. Uh, honorable members, uh, it's that time now to say whether you agree with the yes, chief sir. who requested that we adopt the, the question. Is there any objection? None, thank you. Uh, uh, the report is agreed to. Uh, honorable members, uh, let me thank uh, the House Chair, uh, including all interpreters and the sign language interpreters for making our session smooth. Thank you very much, all of you honorable members, especially the disciplined you who caused no havoc in the meeting today. That concludes the business of the day and the House is adjourned. Oh, thank you, Viva, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
showcase your gorgeous look just like this beautiful mountain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey. laughs> <Hey. laughs> <laughs> 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 <laughs>